the song right here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa barik wa sallim ala ma'abad. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Alhamdulillah, thum alhamdulillah, we are sitting here to discuss one of the five major pillars of Islam. And this year's Hajj is a bit unique for those that are going. I know it's been a, been a roller coaster, I would say, um, of joining groups and then not joining those groups and then applying for visas through the portal, waiting for confirmation. People are still waiting. So it's, it's, it's been a limbo, it's been a challenge, it's been a mujahada. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all the difficulties that we're going through. And in order to fulfill the, you know, the obligation of Hajj. And every difficulty that a believer goes in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the believer. So much so that if a person is looking for something in one pocket and the item is in the other pocket, even that much small difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards for that difficulty as well. And over here, people are going through difficulties. Why? In order to fulfill the great command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go to Hajj, to visit the Kaaba, to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant patience to everyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us reward for the patience we have and all the difficulties we have gone through. So today, inshallah, we'll be doing our Hajj seminar. Um, and I would say in today's time, it's more needed than previous years. Because in previous years, the various groups, they had some scholars, they had some guidance. So if a person didn't pay attention too much to the Hajj seminar, they could always catch up in the journey. They'll have people with them. Um, that they could ask, um, but unfortunately that's not going to be possible in today's time, but one advice before we start that do take notes. If you have any questions, please do ask, but it's difficult to retain all the information. It's, it's, it's very difficult. So those that have got the confirmation and they are going to be going, be sure you have a contact with the local scholar that wherever you are, whether it be Medina Sharif, whether in Makkah Sharif, whether it's the day of Arafat, and if you have any questions, you could always refer to the scholar that you're always in reference with, and they could help you out. Because Hajj is a once in a lifetime journey. And the Hajj that we do once, that is the Farad Hajj. All the other Hajj that we might do later on, there will always be Nafil. So the first Hajj is the Hajj, however we do it. If someone says, no, I didn't do my first one properly, let me do another one. Well, the second one will always be nothing. It will never replace the first one. So if you are going for the first time, we want to make sure we do it properly. We fulfill all the rituals and all the rites of Hajj, inshallah. So first we'll start out with the meaning of Hajj. So what does Hajj mean? The literal meaning of Hajj is to make irada, to make intention. And in Islamic terminologies, in Islamic sciences, Hajj is a name of a ibadah that's very specific, that takes place on specific days and a specific place with certain specific actions. So according to Islam, Hajj is the name of certain actions which are performed after donning the ahram with the intention of Hajj. And the rest of the slides is just explaining what are those certain actions. The the Hajj and the obligation can be understood from the Quran and Hadith, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran says, Walillahi ala nasi hajjul bayti man istata alihi sabila, wa man kafara fa inna Allah ghaniyun anil alameen. The Hajj, to make Hajj, is a duty upon mankind owned to Allah, is owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those that are able to do it. In other words, if, if someone has the financial means, also has the physical means, they have the health to support them, and obviously they have the visa, then Hajj becomes fadad upon them. But if they do not have any of these, they don't have the ability to do it, whether financially or physically, then the obligation of Hajj does not fall upon that individual. And there are several virtues, and in fact, entire chapters dedicated 
in the compilation of hadith just for Hajj. But we'll just mention a few over here. That you have this narration of Bukhari Sharif in which Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Umratu ila al-Umrati kaffaratun lima baynahuma wal hajj al-mabrur laysa lahu jaza'un illa al-jannah. That performance of Umrah one after another, it removes, it eliminates, it forgives the sins that have occurred in between. In other words, the Prophet is encouraging us that a person should perform Umrah often. Because why? By performing Umrah often, whatever minor sins we have committed in between, through that Umrah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes away our sins. Yes, for major sins we have to make Tawbah. Tawbah is a condition. But through this, all the minor sins are forgiven. And then the Prophet says, وَالْحَجُّ mabrur, A mabrur hajj. And there are several explanations for a mabrur hajj. One explanation is that hajj in which no sin or mistake has taken place. That's called a hajj mabrur. Another definition of hajj mabrur is that hajj when a person comes back, his life has changed and he's gone closer to Allah. In other words, before hajj his life and after hajj his life is completely different. That's a hajj mabrur, that Allah has accepted that hajj. So hajj mabrur and accepted hajj there is no reward for it except Jannah. In other words, nothing can fulfill the reward of Hajj Mabrur except Jannah itself. In another narration, the Prophet said, Man Hajjah falam yarfuth, walam yafsuk, ghufira lahuma taqaddama min dhambi. Whomsoever performs Hajj for the sake of Allah and does not have any type of sexual relationships, rafath, does not commit any type of sins while in the state of ahram then all the previous sins will be forgiven. Another narration, it comes that the Prophet ﷺ said that a person who performs Hajj, over here the Prophet ﷺ said, Tabi'u bayn al Hajj wal Umrah. Alternate between Hajj and Umrah. For those two, means Hajj and Umrah, they remove poverty. Many times people say that I cannot go for Hajj and Umrah, it's too expensive. I have some saving if I go Umrah. Over here, the Prophet ﷺ said that when you go for Umrah, it removes poverty. You get barakah in your wealth. Obviously, you don't have to be extravagant when you go. You could make a simple hajj and simple Umrah as well. But it removes poverty and sins. Just as fire or a furnace bellows, they remove filth from iron, gold, and silver. Metals, if you want to purify metals, you burn it in a furnace and all the impurities come out. Same way when a person goes for Hajj and Umrah, all the spiritual impurities come out of a person. And then the Prophet ﷺ again says, There is no reward for an accepted Hajj except for paradise. So when we go for Hajj, this once in a lifetime journey, we have to prepare in several ways. We have to physically prepare, but we also have to spiritually prepare. We have to be spiritually be ready because why? It is a waterfall of blessings that come on the Kaaba. And we want to make sure we get maximum benefit. But in order to get maximum benefit, we have to be ready, spiritually ready to take from that. So from before we leave, we have to start spiritually preparing. So when we're there, we are ready to take from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So number one, until our departure, daily perform turaqat shukr of Allah that Allah has allowed us to go. And this year is an eye-opener. Many people made intention. They, you know, they give their deposits and everything. But, you know, as they say, this is a bulawa from Allah. This is an invitation from Allah. Allah calls whomsoever He wishes. Even though we might have health, we might have wealth, we have taken vacations, PTOs from our work and everything. But if Allah does, if Allah is not written for us to go, then at the end we will not go. Many people have been going every year and this year they're not going. The pandemic was an eye opener. That the entire world was at a standstill and no one had, you know, had a chance to go. So if we have the ability to go and we have, you know, our visas came in, still make shukr to Allah and make dua that Allah still allows us to go and no impediments come in our way. So make shukar, because Allah says, la in shakaratum la azid When we are grateful to Allah, Allah will increase us in a bounty. Every day renew our intention. Though Allah, I'm going for Hajj for your sake, to come closer to you. 
to come closer to the Prophet Wasallam, to fulfill your obligation. That is my sake, not because I have vocation, not because I'm retired now and I have savings, so I'm just gonna go for Hajj. I'm going because I want to come closer to you. And number three, repent from all sins. Repent from all sins. Because why we want to gain from the mercy and reward, we have to remove the filth from our hearts. If you're building a garden, you have to take out the weeds. If you're just going to be planting, but you don't make any efforts on the weeds, it's not going to be a garden. It's not going to look beautiful. So you have to make an effort to remove the weeds. Once the weeds are removed, then you start planting those beautiful flowers. It's going to look very beautiful. So this heart is a garden in which we're going to bring the love of Allah, the sunnahs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to bring humility. We're going to bring the love. And we're going to bring you know, the closeness to Allah the love of Islam and all these actions. But in order to have that realization, we have to repent for our sins. Next, we have to educate ourselves, just how we're sitting in the seminar. But as I said, you know, we will learn for the time being, but it's very possible that in a few days we might forget you know, many of the rituals. So have a, a book that you could learn from about the rituals of Hajj. If you don't know which book to read, let me know and I'll give you some names of books that you could purchase for $10, $5 and you could use it you know, for your journey. And try to educate as yourself as much as possible. Send salutations, duru sharif, salawat upon the Prophet daily. Make a goal that until my flight, inshallah, daily I'll do 500, I'll do 1,000, I'll do 2,000. But make a goal of salutation upon the Prophet and fix an amount. Come to the masjid as much as possible. We're going to meet the, the Baytullah, the house of Allah. This is also the house of Allah. So let's start from our local masjids, visiting as much as possible. So this way we could get the grandeur and importance of the main house of Allah, the Kaabatullah. Make dua to Allah that Allah makes his journey easy for us. Because there's multiple ways to go for Hajj. We could go with difficulties or we could go with ease. So we want to ask Allah, though Allah, I am going, but make the journey easy for me, that no difficulties come in my way. And then before leaving, try to meet relatives and friends and ask for forgiveness. Because if you still have any ill feelings, harbor any ill feelings and malice with our loved ones, our relatives, our friends, we want to make sure that we are forgiven by human beings as well because we want to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially if we have wronged someone. If we have taken someone's wealth, pay them back. If we have, if we have oppressed someone, we have to ask them for forgiveness. So if we have said any words of harm, of did any harm, this is a time to forget, and this is a time to ask for forgiveness. So request them for du'as as well. And if you have any debts, any short-term debts, try to settle those debts before we leave. Yes, if you have long-term debts, like you have a house mortgage that's 30 years, it's okay, because that's a fixed you know, payment that you do. You don't have to sort that out, all as a person probably will never go for Hajj, if it, or they'll go after 30 years. So if you have long-term debts, that's okay. But any short-term debts, you owe money to someone. Try to settle those before you go to the best of your ability. And finish one book of seerah. We're about to go to the city of the Prophet ﷺ. We want to gain as much knowledge about the Prophet ﷺ as we can, so we could really appreciate our time in Medina Sharif. So that was the spiritual preparation. Now we have the physical preparation. Hajj is not easy on the body. Especially for us living in the West where we drive everywhere and we do not walk. The hardest thing for people is just the walk for Hajj. The heat and the walk. Because they're not used to walking. So let's prepare physically every day, walk for 30 minutes, make a goal, nice weather outside, maybe after Asar, go with the family, take the family and go for a walk. So you get used to walking every day. In fact, not just the days of Hajj, even in Medina Sharif, if your hotel is a little bit far away, for you to go and pray in the masjid all the way in the front, it's a good 15 minute walk sometimes, just for the daily salah. For five times, you're gonna be walking 15 minutes and coming back 15 minutes. So that's why you need to start walking from now and try to walk as much as possible. Next, appoint someone to look after your house, your bills, etc., your mail. These are small things that people tend to forget. And usually when you're over there, it's like, oh no, my mailbox is gonna be clogged up. I forgot to tell someone. You could always send a message to the post office to delay your mail, etc., or reroute it to someone else's house. Um, also, if you're going to be using any credit card, be sure you call and say that you could use it out of, because why? A lot of times people want to use credit cards over there and is rejected because they think it's fraud. So you want to call and make sure that you're also prepared for this as well. 
And then mental preparation. The thing I tell people to pack the most is patience. Your patience will be tested every day. And as the days go further, they get tested even more. You have to keep in mind that we live in a comfort zone here in America. We're going to be out of our comfort zone. We'll be traveling with people that are not in the same temperament as us. We'll be roommates with people that might not be in the same temperament with us. Um, food might not be to our liking. There'll be heat. You'll be walking in the heat sometimes. Um, so you have many things that go against your norm, and it tests a person. So this is a time you have to be patient, that I came here for a purpose. I did not come here for comfort. I did not come here for sightseeing. Whatever difficulties I have, I'm just going to let go. I want Allah to forgive me of all my shortcomings. And we have so many shortcomings. So if any shortcoming of someone else, I'm just going to let go. Someone said something mean to me, I'm going to forgive them. Someone took the better spot in the tent, okay, I'm not going to complain about it. Let them have the better, in a better spot in the tent in Mina. Um, someone took more food than you know, others, it's okay. Just let go, have as much patience as possible. Do not get angry. Do not get angry. Every year in Hajj, we have usually one person or one family that loses their cool, loses their patience, and it seems like their entire Hajj they have wasted just because now they lost their cool. They'll start yelling, foul language, physical fights. They're ready to roll up their sleeves and fight with people. Because why? They're tested. So make an effort that you just keep it cool and do not get angry. Forgive and forget minor issues. Yes, if there's some major issues, then go to the right authorities. It doesn't mean that you let someone oppress you. Okay, we're not talking about oppression here. We're talking about like just minor issues. Just don't sweat it. Don't make a big deal out of it. And try to have a positive attitude as much as possible. Do not be in the company of those that complain. Some people, their nature is just to complain, no matter what situation they're in. You do not want them in your circle. Because why? It takes one person to ruin the atmosphere of the entire group. They start complaining, someone else joins them, third, third person joins them, a fourth person joins them. Now all they're doing is talking bad about the rest of the group, about the group leader, about Hajj. They're complaining about dirt on the street. I'm like, we're not there to clean the streets of Makkah and Medina. Yes, it would be nice if it's clean, but this is not a concern that you need to go talk around to everyone. That why is it not clean? Concentrate on what you're there for. Okay, so try to have a positive attitude and, and stay away from people that have negative, negative attitude because the entire Hajj will be ruined in negativity then. And be prepared for discomfort and difficulties. It's just part of the journey. It's part of the journey. No pain, no gain. We want to gain from this journey, right? There will be some pain. There will be some difficulties. So hope for the best, plan for the best, but expect that something can go wrong and there will be difficulties in your food, in your sleep, in your health, people get sick. So you have to pe you know, be prepared for that mentally. Now, what are certain things that hujjaj should pack? Have sufficient amount of money, certain amount of cash, take your credit card, a debit card if you need to, but you wanna make sure just, just in case of emergency, you wanna have some you know, backup cash as well. If, you have, if you're taking daily medicine, be sure you pack your medicine. Um, in the past, it was easy to get medicine from the pharmacies in Saudi Arabia, but now they also ask for prescription for everything. So for example, if you want antibiotics, in the past few years ago, you could go and get antibiotics without a prescription. Now they do not give um, antibiotics to anyone without a prescription. So if you need prescription medicine, be sure you take it before you go. Have your passport and visas and make copies of it as well. I always say make copies, keep certain copies with you, keep certain copies at home over here with a family or a friend, just in case of emergency that something happens and you need a copy, okay? Your passport most likely will be taken. In the past, again, I don't know what will be happening this year, but in the past, um, the Hajj ministry and the ones responsible, they will take your passport as soon as you land in Saudi Arabia. And you will only get your passport back on the way to the airport back to America. So you'll not have your passport with you at all. But you want to have a, a copy of your passport and a copy of your visa. Because many times if you want to get, for example, a SIM card for your phone, they won't give you a SIM card unless you show them a copy of your passport or your visa. But your passport is already taken. So now you're in a dilemma, right? So you want to make sure that you make your copies before you go. Take a dua book. Whenever you're free in your flight, on the bus, engage in dhikr of Allah. Engage in your daily du'as, your morning du'as, your evening du'as. 
the more we spend time in ibadah, the more reward we're going to get. Clothing takes sufficient clothing. They do have laundry there as well, but you want to take sufficient clothing as well. Um, I always recommend having two pairs of ahram, just in case one gets spoiled. You have a backup ahram as well. So for men, have two you know, pairs of ahram. I always recommend that. For sisters, there is no specific ahram. This is a confusion that many sisters think that they have to wear like a special cloth made up white or something like that, or whatever they have, you know, a sign for ahram. That's their ahram. No. There's no specific clothing for women. They could wear anything and they could change every day. Um, take a water bottle because why? You, you will get dehydrated. It's very hot. You'll be walking a lot. So you want to make sure that you have a water bottle. And while you're in the Haramein Sharifain, the two holy cities, why drink any water besides Zamzam water? So you could always fill up Zamzam you know, from the masjid and bring it back to your hotel room, drink it. you know. So throughout the journey, at least in those two holy cities, don't drink any water besides Zamzam water. Over here, when someone gives us even a small glass, we're so happy. Over there, you could drink as much as you want. But we're drinking other waters, or bottled water, or tap water. Drink Zamzam. So if you have bottled water, you could always you know, take water with you. And carry an unlocked cell phone in case you have to use a Saudi SIM for the two apps that are required now for Hajj. So you want to make sure. So before you confirm, before going, that your phone is unlocked. Don't assume that's unlocked. Go, go and verify it. Because we had people in Umrah and in Hajj, they thought their phone was unlocked. They just assumed that when they went there, it wasn't. And they had to buy another phone, etc. So it does become a problem. So make sure your phone is unlocked if you want to use a Saudi SIM card. Um, carry Vaseline around. This is for men specifically. In the state of Ahram, when you're walking, um, a lot of times between your thighs, they rub a lot and your skin becomes chaffed. Um, it's very painful. So you want to make sure that you apply Vaseline in those areas so you're not in discomfort. And carry a portable battery charger. This is a lifesaver. <laughs> because many families and friends, they communicate, they make a WhatsApp group, and they communicate with each other. In the past, when we went in groups, the entire group would be in one group, in one WhatsApp group, and we would give updates of travel and this and that and everything. So you want to make sure your phone is charged. And when you're in Mina and Arafat, sometimes it's very hard to charge your phone. So in those places where it's not easy to get an outlet, if you have a phone charger, you could easily charge your phone then. Okay, yes. Just, just nothing thick. It's going to be hot. It's summer, but no specific. You know, don't wear black. Black will attract heat more. Don't wear something thick. Um, but I do recommend light clothing. Um, a lot of people they just buy a cheap thobe from there on the streets for ten dollars, and that's how much it costs to wash. So they just wear it once and put it aside and, and, and don't wear it again. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is, you know, you could just, I mean, you don't have to take 10, 15 pairs, but they take enough and you have laundry there that you could get it washed in. Okay. Um, so now the first stop, it depends on your package where you're going first. Some people go to Medina first, some people go to Mecca first. But based on where your first destination is, certain legal Islamic rulings will be affected. So if you're going to Mecca first, if you're going to Mecca first, you're going to be landing in Jeddah. You're going to do your Hajj first. And after your Hajj is finished, then you'll go to Medina Sharif. Now, some people, they go to Medina first. They'll land in Medina, or they might land in Mecca and go to, you know, take a bus to Medina. But they'll do the visitation in Medina first. Then they'll do Hajj, and after Hajj, they'll come back to America. So if you're going to Mecca first, and, and you're doing the Mecca section first, and then Medina, you have to be in the state of Ahram before you land in Jeddah. Because Jeddah is within the boundaries of Miqat. So before you pass the boundary, you have to be in the state of Ahram. So whatever your transit airport, uh, airport is, whether it be you know, Turkey or whether it be in Dubai, you'll have to wear the Ahram there before you land in Jeddah. Do not try to wear it in the plane, it's very difficult. Bathrooms are very small, sometimes the najasat, you know, there's impurities. You don't want to take chances. So wear the ahram from before, before you land in Jeddah. If you are not wearing the ahram and you land in Jeddah, you would either have to go out of the boundary, wear it and come back, or you have to give a penalty and sacrifice an animal. So let's not try to start the journey with penalties, right? So be sure you have the ahram from beforehand. So 
So if you so if it's a direct flight to Jeddah from you know from New York, for example then the recommendation is that where the ahram from New York, don't make the intention until halfway of the flight. When you're cl coming closer to Saudi, then make the intention. And I'll explain that, that you do not come in the state of ahram just by wearing the cloth. You have to do some other rituals to be in the state of ahram. Okay, so we'll talk about that now. So in that case, wear the ahram, but make the intention later. And if you're going to Medina Sharif first, then you don't have to be in the state of Ahram because you'll wear the Ahram once you're done with the visitation of Medina. And when you're leaving Medina to Mecca, then you'll wear the Ahram. So I'll start with the Medina section first because usually that's where we do. We, can, we would go to Medina first. So that's how the slides I made. So we'll talk about Medina and then we'll talk about Hajj. Respect to brothers and elders, just visiting Medina Sharif, it's, it's a blessing in itself. There are several names for Medina. You have the word Taba, Tayyiba, but one you know, name that I really like is Medina Munawwara. Munawwara means full of nur, the illuminated city. And in fact, it is full of nur, because why? The Prophet ﷺ was resting there. Our beloved, our Habib, Muhammad Mustafa ﷺ, he's buried in Medina Sharif, and we're going to visit the Prophet ﷺ. So this is the second holiest city in Islam. After Makkah, the second holy city is Medina Sharif. And this is a city, it's full of rich history. This is where Islam spread throughout the world. So there's a lot of history that also takes place that you'll go and you'll see, inshallah, as well. So there are certain etiquettes that we have to keep in mind while in the city of Medina. Number one um, is before leaving for Medina. So if you're you know, going in transit and you're about to sit in flights towards Medina, Make intention that, oh Allah, I'm going to visit Medina, number one, to pray in the Masjid Nabawi, and number two, to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to pray Salah in Masjid Nabawi, and also to visit and say Salaam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then on the way, do not engage in watching TV or what's on the screens or on your phone. Engage in Duru Sharif, salutation upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Send as much as you can. We're about to visit the Prophet Sallallahu send these gifts to the Prophet Sallallahu before we visit the Prophet Sallallahu And as the city nears, our excitement should increase. Our hearts, kafiya, the you know, situation of our heart should change slowly. And the way I like to you know, always say is that, let's say we're traveling from far away and we're traveling alone and now we're coming home. We're coming back to Chicago. And when we're coming back to Chicago, we're thinking about our wives, we're thinking about our husband or our children. And, you know, as the flight comes closer to O'Hare Airport, in our mind, our, you know, the pictures of our children come in our mind. Oh, they're going to be at the airport, they're going to be excited to see me, they're going to hug me. And we naturally get a smile on our face that I'm going to see my family just now. In a few moments, I'm going to land and they're going to be waiting for me and they're going to hug me and they're going to... Because why? We love our family. We love our family, and just the thought of separating from our family and coming after a long time, and just the thought of them going to be there waiting for us, it excites us so much. And as the city comes closer, we get more and more excited. So this is our beloved, the person that we love the most. The Prophet ﷺ said, none of you can be a true believer until he does not love me more than his parents, his children, and the entire world. When nasi ajma'een. So we love the Prophet ﷺ the most. Now with that love, think that we're coming closer and closer and closer to the Prophet ﷺ. How is the excitement going to be for us? So if you cannot create the excitement, force it. That I'm going to see my Prophet ﷺ. I'm going to visit him. I'm going to say salam to him. All this time from America, I've been sending salutation. I'm going to be directly in front of his grave and say the salam to him directly. So that excitement should build as we come closer to Medina Sharif. So here's a small map, an aerial map of Medina. So the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu is what you see in white over there. And all around it is the courtyard. Please make an effort to pray your salah in the masjid. You'll find many people, they pray salat right outside the masjid. Why? Because after salat they want to leave and come back to the hotel. And I think that they spend so much money, so much time, and they're praying outside the masjid. We, we, we sacrifice so much to go there, why would we not pray inside the masjid? So make a goal that every salah, we will pray inside the masjid. And it's going to be crowded, so I have to leave my hotel room a little bit before the adhans to make sure that I get into the masjid in time. So pray inside the masjid. 
So the Green Dome is very significant in Islam and our history. Why? Because right underneath the Green Dome is where the Prophet ﷺ is resting. And usually the poets, they always talk about, you know, the Green Dome in the poetry, and, you know, in Arabic poetry, in Urdu poetry, jaise hi bad nazar aayega, bandagi ka karina badal jayega, that as soon as I see the Green Dome, my, you know, my worship and my quality worship is going to change. Sar jukane ke fursat milengi kise? that I won't even have time to make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go in sajda to thank Allah. My tears are going to go in sajda and they're going to start falling. You know, so the green dome, why? Because as soon as you see the green dome, you know my prophet is right there underneath the green dome. Then you have Jannatul Baqi. And this is open only to men. We'll talk about this. Um, they're open two times a day, right after Fajr, right after Asr. So the men should try to go and visit. More than 10,000 Sahaba are buried there. Countless awliya Allah, the friends of Allah, and the Muslims that are buried over there. So you want to go and visit the Prophet ﷺ would visit Bucky often. Um, the main gate, the King Fahd gate, is where it's pointed. And the ladies' sections, there are two sections for ladies' prayer. One on the left side, one on the right side. And I'll talk about that as well. And usually the main hotel area is towards um, the, um, the north side. So regarding the Masjid al nabi the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Salatun fi masjidi hada khairun min alf salatin fi masiwa illa al masjid haram." That one prayer in my masjid is better than a thousand prayers elsewhere. So one salat that you pray in Masjid Nabawi is multiplied by a thousand times. Except for Masjid al Haram, which is in Makkah, one salat in Makkah is multiplied by a hundred thousand times. So this is the time for us to take from the treasure. It's like winning the lottery. You could take as much as you want. And the scholars of Islam, they have you know, stated that this reward is not just for salah. Any good deed that you do in the masjid, you do dhikr, you do Quran, you do charity, everything is multiplied by a thousand times. So the reward that we pray at home, two rakats, and the reward that we pray in masjid of the Prophet wasallam is a thousand times more virtuous. However, only the reward is multiplied by a thousand times, not the salat itself. So if someone says that, you know what, I missed five years of salah, so let me just make one over there and it's gonna multiply a thousand times, so I don't have to make up all the previous salats. No, the reward is multiplied, but not the salat itself, okay? So what are the etiquettes of visiting the Masjid Nabawi? It is preferable to take a bath and wear one's best clothing and for men to apply fragrance, idar, and then prior to going and entering the masjid, try to give some sadaqah. You know, they're poor there, they're workers there. Give sadaqah, five riyals, ten riyals, fifteen riyals, whatever you may. Give some sadaqah before visiting the Prophet ﷺ. And then in a dignified manner, with awe and love of the Prophet ﷺ, go towards Masjid Nabawi. If you have someone that could explain a little bit more about the Prophet and the love of the Prophet, have a small lecture. So we have that, you know, within us, consciousness, and then proceed to visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Try to keep your minds and hearts clear of everything else but the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So whatever is happening in America, our families, our jobs, everything, just let it out of your mind for a few moments. And visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with a very clear mind. And when we enter the masjid, we enter with the right foot and recite the dua, Bismillahi wa salamu ala rasulillah, Allah maghfirli, dhunubi, waftahli, abwaab rahmatik. That we say, we start with the name of Allah and salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah forgive my sins and open the doors of mercy for me. Open the doors of your mercy for me. So when we enter the masjid, multiple doors of mercies are opening for us. And make intention that, oh Allah, as long as I'm in the masjid, whether it be for five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, two hours, I'll be in the state of a'tikaf. Then pray tahiyyatul masjid if it's not makhru time. Because as soon as you enter the masjid, it is from the etiquette of the masjid to pray tahiyyatul masjid. If you can go all the way to Riyadh al Jannah and pray these two rakats, good, but usually there's specific times and you're not able to go. So wherever in the masjid you can pray two rakats, tahiyyatul masjid, pray tahiyyatul masjid, and then make dua to Allah, oh Allah, I came to visit the Prophet sallallahu make it easy for me and accept it from me. There will be separate times for men and women to pray in Riyadh al-Jannah. Some of the text has been cut off um, in this. So there are three times for sisters. Now again, this changes. So if you, when you go to Medina Sharif, usually the hotel people will tell you the time. What are the times for the women's you know, visitation? Keep that in mind because the sisters can only say salam and visit the Riyadh al-Jannah and visit the Prophet on very specific times. 
So this is the main entrance for men that we see. The main entrance is not open 24 hours. Uh, at nighttime, they do close it, but the front, all the way to the front where the, you know, where the Riyadh al-Jannah is and where the Prophet sallallahu is resting, that part is open 24 hours. So in the Prophet's mosque, so we have the large mosque, and within the mosque, we have the original mosque of the Prophet sallallahu And if you look on the pillars, they will be written in Arabic, this is the boundary of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu so within the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, there's some significant pillars and landmarks that we should be conscious of. Um, for example, you have you know, the green part that's there, that is the rawda. The Prophet ﷺ said, That piece of earth that's between my mimbar and my house is a piece of jannah from the jannahs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the scholars give multiple explanations from this, but the most accepted explanation is this is an actual piece of Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in this world. And we make dua that Allah, once He enters us into Jannah, that Allah will also make us enter into Jannah in the hereafter, inshallah. Then there's a pillar, pillar number four. It says, Ustuwanu Aisha. This is a very specific pillar. If you can pray behind that pillar, try to pray behind that pillar. Why? Because one time Aisha radiallahu anha was giving a talk and she said there is a pillar in the masjid that people knew the significance and the importance of this uh, pillar and how important and virtuous to pray behind this pillar. People would fight with each other to pray behind this pillar. But she did not indicate what that pillar was. So the nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha, he follows her to the house. He's a nephew, so you could follow. So he followed her to the house. And then he comes out of the house and prays behind his pillar. <laughs> so the ulama said that she informed him where the pillar was. So that's why it's written there that Hadehi Ustawana to Aisha. To try to pray behind that pillar. Then you have the pillar where the Prophet used wished to make atikaf as well. You have the pillar where a sahabi tied himself up that I will not free myself until Allah does not forgive me. That's a pillar of tawbah, pillar of repentance. Um, but next to it, you have where the Prophet ﷺ was resting. So there are three graves, three Mubarak graves there. You have the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Right underneath that, you have Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, and then you have Umar al Farooq radiallahu anhu. So these three are buried, and there's one spot open, inshallah, when Mahdi comes, or you know, then he'll be buried over no, Sorry, not Mahdi. When Isa al Islam comes, he'll be buried over there. Um, and then in the back, you have you know, the, you know, the raised platform as well. So this is from the inside. Before they had a separate color carpet for Riyadh al-Jannah, but when we went a few months ago, they made the entire area the same carpet, so it's hard for you to tell now that which section is the Riyadh al-Jannah, which section is not. So try to get as close as you can, as far as you can inside for the Riyadh al-Jannah. So this is the member of the Prophet ﷺ where he would give his khutbah. Um, this is the mahrab where the Prophet ﷺ used to you know, lead the prayers. And this is the Riyadh al-Jannah. In the old days, they had a cream color carpet, greenish cream color carpet, to you know, distinguish from the carpet on um, other areas. But in today's time, they stopped doing that. So this is where the specific pillars are. They have a, like a landmark or a sign like this. So the one on top, it says, Ustuwana Aisha. You could kind of make out the word Aisha right on top. And the one, the picture on the bottom, it says, Hadihi Ustuwan to Sarir. Sarir means bed. This is where the Prophet would lay his bed in the month of Ramadan for Atakaf. Every year he would make Atakaf over here. So, what are the virtues of visiting the Prophet? The Prophet said, Whoever visits my grave, my shafa'a, my intercession becomes obligatory for him. So, just visiting the Prophet, inshallah, will get the shafa'at of the Prophet. The Prophet said, Whoever visits me, after my death, it's like visiting me during my life. And it is the view of the Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the prophets are alive in the grave. Yes, they passed away from this world, but they're not like all the others who have passed away. They are alive, they're conscious. They don't have humanly bodily needs, like food, drink, sleep, but they are conscious, they are awake, and they're alive. So when we visit the Prophet ﷺ, he hears us and he replies to us. Whoever travels specifically to visit me will be my neighbor on the Day of Judgment. So we are visiting and we're going to Medina specifically to visit the Prophet ﷺ. Inshallah, through these narrations, we hope that Allah SWT makes us the neighbors of the Prophet ﷺ on the Day of Judgment. 
So when we say salam to the Prophet ﷺ and greet the Prophet ﷺ, the men will have this view. Sisters will not have this. Many sisters, they said, hey, I did not see this because sisters are not allowed to come to this area. So they will only say salam to the Prophet from the side. But the men will come in the front. So there are three large gates, but it's the main middle two doors that we have to concentrate on. And in the middle two doors, there is a one large circle and two smaller circles. So the large circle, that's where the Prophet ﷺ's Mubarak face is. The Prophet ﷺ is laying and his face is facing towards that large circle. And the second two is Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar radiallahu anhumah. So first we say salam to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as much as we can. Then we move over to and say salam to Ubaid Siddiq, and then we say salam to Umar al Farooq. And this is how they are resting behind these circles. <clears throat> now for the sisters, um, from the north entrance, you'll have two sections that you pray salah: the left and the right. But the left side is the side which leads up to the Riyadh al-Jannah and to say salam to the Prophet So if they're praying on the right side, there is no way. You just pray salah and go back to your hotel. But if it's one of those times where the sisters could go pray in Riyadh al-Jannah, you want to make sure you're on the left side. Because they'll make a path, they'll make like a, um, a pathway for you to go and say salam to the Prophet ﷺ and also to pray in Riyadh al-Jannah. And now they have specific times, you have an app, and when is your specific time on your app, that's the time that you have to go. You have to show the app on your phone to the person standing there, sitting there, and, and, and when they see the app, only then they'll let you go forward. Um, a lot of restrictions now. <clears throat> Next we have Jannat al-Baqi, or the graveyard of Baqi. Um, this is where the Prophet ﷺ would visit often. He would visit on a weekly basis just to say salam to the people that are buried there. So thousands of companions, countless sahabas, um, so countless pious predecessors are buried here. The Prophet ﷺ was ordered by Allah to go to Baqi and make dua for the people of Baqi. So this is our sunnah as well. So the dua that we read in, you know, when we go visit a graveyard, you can read the same dua. Assalamu alaikum, mu'minin. That peace be upon you, O dwellers of the Muslim community. What you were promised in the future, you have received. And God willingly, inshallah, we are going to join you as well. And then you make specific dua for the people of Baqi. O oh Allah, forgive the people of Baqi. O oh Allah, forgive the people of Baqi. So in Baqi, there are maps to kind of guide you. Who's, the people that are working there, they're not going to tell you. If you ask them who's buried here, who's buried there, they will just be quiet. They say, it's all the same. Just say your salam and go back. So for some reason, they're not going to specify where Uthman radiallahu is buried. But you want to say salam to Uthman and make dua for him as well. You want to see the other companions and where they're buried, right? So there are maps of, you know, Jannat al-Baqi that you could download online as well that kind of guides you to see, okay, where is the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibrahim, where is he buried? You know, where is in Halima Sa'diya buried? Or where is in Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, where is he buried? Where is Imam Malik, the great scholar, Imam Malik and his teacher, Imam Nafi, where are they buried? Um, so, you know, these maps, inshallah, will help you out as well. So again, this is from the north. Um, we have the Masjid, the Qibla is this way, um, al -Baqi. Um, and then you have the main entrance for Baqi. Um, be sure you go right after the Salah, right after Fajr, right after Asr, or else they do close it. And sisters are not able to go. And right behind, towards the north, behind Masjid Nabawi is a mountain, that's Mount Urhad. Okay. Now, the remainder of time we have, there's nothing specifically to do in Medina Sharif besides salutation on the Prophet Sallallahu And if you have a chance to do a tour of the city, they have tours, try to see, you know, try to go to Masjid Quba, Masjid Qiblatain, go to Mount Uhud. If that's part of your package and you're able to go, try not. If, if not, take a taxi and just go. But if you're going for the first time or if you're going after a very long time, you want to visit these places. So make a goal to perform all five prayers in the masjid. Do not leave the hotel room at the time of Adhan. You're not going to make it. Because everyone wants to leave at the same time. So the elevators are you know, packed. You have to wait and time goes. The best time for sisters to go to Riyadh al-Jannah is at the end of the allocated time. This is before they had specific apps. Now you just follow whatever app timing that gives you. You go in that time. 
okay, um, plan to sit in the masjid between two salats. Because we're going there not for sightseeing or resting in a hotel. The hotel is just for, you know, just to get fresh. So you want to try to spend as maximum time in the masjid. So what I recommend to people is that make a goal that either from Asar to Maghrib, you're going to sit in the masjid. You pray Asar, sit there, do Quran, do Dhikr, pray Maghrib, and then come out. Or from Maghrib to Isha. Maghrib to Isha is just one hour, 15 minutes. So it's a very short time. So many people do that. They go from Maghrib. They'll stay there until Isha. They pray their Isha. They pray their Salat, so with that, and then come back, and then, and then they have the dinner. So this way, at least you got some quality time in the masjid to do dua, to do dhikr, to recite Quran Sharif. And try to talk less with people and more with Allah while you're in the masjid. People sit there and they chit chat about everything that's happening, politics. What happened to you know, the January 6th and what's going on? Like, who cares? You're not there for this. You're there to connect with Allah. So in the masjid, read Quran, do dhikr, or do dua. But try to talk as less as possible. And yes. Hotels don't have the packages. No. So usually the groups, when we had groups, the groups would do that. If not, um, there's taxis available. You could just you know make a group and go. They actually have now tour buses that you know they're public buses that you just jump on and they just drop you off at those locations as well. Okay. But do find out because things are changing on a weekly basis, it seems like, right? So you wanna make sure that you find out when you go there. Uber also works there, yeah. Okay, so now before leaving, oh, let me go back, sorry. Um, before leaving for Mecca, we wanna leave the city of Medina with the heavy heart, with sorrow that we did not fulfill the rights of the Prophet wasalam, the city of Medina. There are great rights for the people of Medina. And the masjid. Um, this is not time to go into detail, but obviously we're weak and we're going to not fulfill the rights, so we need to ask forgiveness from Allah um, that we did not fulfill the rights. And with Isari's heart, why? Because we don't know when's the next time we ever get to see the Prophet in the city again. So, you know, make dua to Allah that Allah takes us there time and again, and then inshallah we proceed towards Miqat. So now we'll talk about the actual Hajj now. So, first terminology that we need to learn is Miqat. Miqat is a geographical boundary that anyone who intends to go for Hajj or Umrah may not pass the boundary without being the state of Ahram. So you have to be in the state of Ahram before you cross this boundary. So that boundary is called Miqat. And if a person intending to perform Hajj or Umrah crosses it without Ahram, they have to go back to the boundary and don it again. And if they don't, they have to sacrifice an animal. Um, so be sure you're in the state of Ahram before you cross. So here is a, just a map for you to understand. Those that are going to Medina first, Dhul Hulayfa will be your closest boundary, which is about 30 minutes away from Medina. So you will probably wear the Ahram from the hotel. You could even make the intention from the hotel. Okay? And before you cross you know, Dhul Hulayfa, you have to be in the state of Ahram. Those that are going to Makkah first, you could see Jiddah is within the boundaries. Jiddah? is within the boundary, so before you cross the boundary and land Jiddah, you have to be in the state of Ahram. We're not coming from India or Pakistan, so we won't get into that discussion. Okay. So now, there are three types of Hajj that a person can intend. The first one I have written here is Qiran. Qiran is to make intention for Hajj and Umrah in the same intention, in the same Ahram. In other words, you do your Umrah, once you're done with the Umrah, you stay in Ahram, you do not cut your hair, and you remain in the state of Ahram until the days of Hajj come. And then when the days of Hajj come, you do your Hajj, and after you finish your Hajj, that's when you cut your hair and come out of the Ahram. So in other words, you're joining the Umrah and the Hajj in the same Ahram, same intention, which is a lot more difficult. Because why? When you're in the state of Ahram, there are certain restrictions that you have to adhere. You cannot use you know, scented soap, you cannot apply perfume, you cannot cut your hair, you cannot pull on your hair. So there are a lot of little restrictions we'll talk about, we have to adhere. So if you've done your Umrah, let's say in the first of the Hijjah, and Hajj starts all the way on the eighth of the Hijjah, those seven days in between, you're still in the state of Ahram, which becomes very difficult for people. But it's more rewarding at the same time, okay? 
The second type is ifrad. Ifrad is you don't do umrah, you only do hajj. So you wear the ahram just for the sake of hajj. When you, when you reach Makkah, you don't perform umrah. And when the days of hajj comes, you go straight for hajj. After hajj is done, you come back. That's ifrad. This is usually for the people of Makkah. Those that are staying local in Makkah, they do this. Okay? But the one, the type that most people from foreign countries they do is called tamattu. So the third type is tamattu, and we will concentrate on tamattu in this um, seminar. So tamattu literally means to benefit. But what is tamattu? That hajj, it means that a person, he enters Makkah with the intention just to do umrah. So let's say you're coming from Medina, or you're coming from America, and you're landing straight to um, coming to Makkah. So when you come to Makkah, you come with the intention of just Umrah first. You do Umrah. So you come to the Masjid, Masjid Haram, you do your Umrah. After you're done with the Umrah, you do Safa Marwa, you finish the entire Umrah, you get your hair cut. And you come out of the Ahram. When you come out of Ahram, you wear your normal clothing now. And everything is permissible now. Okay? So you wear your normal clothing. So the next few days, until the days of Hajj start, you're in your normal clothing. You're not in a state of Ahram. Then when the days of Hajj come close, the 7th or the 8th of the Hijjah, now you make the intention again to come in the state of Ahram, but for Hajj only. So you made a separate intention of Umrah, finished Umrah, came out of that Ahram. You relaxed, enjoyed, you're in your normal clothing, everything is normal. Then when Hajj comes, you make a separate intention for Hajj now. Just for Hajj now. That is called Tamattu. That is called Hajj Tamattu. And majority of the people do Hajj Tamattu. Yes. So you tell us um, flights created by Allah and all these other things. Um, let's say someone doesn't have time or they leave like on 8th Dhul Hijjah and Makkah. Can they do the Ifrad? If yes. So, very good question. So if someone's flight, like they're landing on the 8th and they have to go from the airport to Mina, right? Um, then they'll do Ifrad. Then they'll do Ifrad. But if you're, if you're coming on the 6th or 7th, because... Umrah takes about three hours only, right? So you're able to do Umrah, usually, beforehand. Yes? So people that are doing uh, Umrah before, after they're out of the Ahram, then when they enter the state of Ahram, what time do they still have to go back? No. To Very good question. So if you're doing Tamato, you do your Ahram for Umrah at the boundary. Once you finish your Umrah, you come out of the Ahram. Now when you come in the state of Hajj, you just do it from Makkah. You don't have to come out. Okay? <clears throat> so you just do it from the hotel room. Yes? <laughs> very good question. Um, if the days in between are very little, so, so the question is that some people's flights are such that they'll just land a few days before the actual hut starts. So it's not that difficult to remain in Ahram. So I normally, we do Qiran, because we go to Medina first, and from Medina we come to Makkah on the 6th or 7th of the Hijjah, and there's like a day in between. It's not that difficult to stay in Ahram for an extra day. So we'll do Qiran. So if, but that's up to the individuals, because some people, they're not used to wearing Ahram. So even one day of just extra Ahram, they're just so uncomfortable. Right? So they're like, you know, I'd rather wear my normal clothes for one day and be comfortable and do tamato. So that's an individual preference. But if a person is able to remain in ahram for one extra day or two extra days, then Quran obviously is more rewarding. Okay? Yes. Yes. There's a difference of opinion. Okay? Imam Malik says it was ifrad. Um, <laughs> uh, Imam Shafi says tamato. Um, we say tamattu, but we say tamattu was done for a specific reason for the Sahaba. But Qiran, because there's more, there's more mushakka, and the rule in Islam is al ajru bi qadr al mushakka. Reward is proportional to how much difficulty a person goes through, right? Um, so Qiran is afdal. So there is a difference of opinion among the fuqah. Hajj is a very unique chapter in the hadith. Yes. For example, if you use their, uh, their tools before Hajj, uh, do you No, you shouldn't. Yeah, you shouldn't do multiple umrahs in between. Okay? Yeah. Just one umrah before Hajj. So we'll talk about that towards the end when Hajj is finished. Yes.
once you don a specific ahram, you cannot downgrade, you could upgrade. So in other words, if you did ifrad, you could upgrade to tamatto. If you did tamatto, you could upgrade to qiran. From qiran, you cannot go back to tamatto. <laughs> yeah, so start with tamatto, but if you're doing tamatto, you could always do qiran. Okay, um, but again, I mean, you'll be able to figure this out very quickly if your flights, you know, how much time you have. Uh, it's not that difficult, it's not that much of a difference between Quran and Tamatto. Um, the rulings will be the same. Again, please have a local scholar's contact with you to help you. Okay, yes? So if somebody who's going from here to Jeddah, to get into Umrah the way first, then they have to go to Medina. After Medina, we have to come back to Jeddah before Hajj. Is that, is that how that? That's what oh my God. <laughs> So the question is that certain flights are going to Jeddah, doing their Umrah, then they're going to Medina, and then they're coming back to um, Mecca. So in that case, there is a lot of discussion on that. Um, that's like the most um, non-recommended way to do things, <laughs> okay? Um, so if people are going to Jeddah first, do the Umrah, then going to Medina, and then, so then from Medina, you could just wear the ahram of Hajj, and that was still be tamattu, okay? So you wear the ahram of Hajj from Medina and come. The preferred way is that if you have a chance to do another Umrah, do another Umrah, and then do um, your Hajj, okay? So again, it will depend on how much time you have. So everyone's situation seems to be slightly different and slightly unique. So it's hard to give like a general advice for specific situations. So I think for specific situations, it would be best if after the seminar, you actually come talk to, call a scholar up, speak for 30 minutes, and get your questions like, you know, really cleared out. Yes. Are you raising your hand? Yes. Is it better to go to Makkah or Medina first, you're asking? Well, at the moment, people don't have a choice, right? They just have to go according to whatever their groups they're assigned. But if you're coming from the north, then if, you know, if, you know, if Medina is on the way, then it's better to go to Medina first. If it's your first Hajj, it's better to go to Makkah first and Medina afterwards, if you're coming from the other way. But it's not good to pass by Medina and not go there. It's on the way, then stop Medina first. So yeah, that discussion is there in the books. Okay, so now let's talk about Ahram. Yes. Yeah, so far whatever I said, you can make it in your language, okay? Um, yeah, the, the, the only time things have to be in Arabic is in Salah, and the Adhan has to be in Arabic, in Adhan Iqama, and whatever you pray in Salah. Besides that, everything else, nothing has to be in Arabic, okay? No, if you're doing Quran, then you cannot do Tamatu after that. Once you make it, yeah. yes. So I'll come to that. So I think a lot of your questions might be answered as I, I you know, move forward in the slides. Um, so let's move forward, um, and then if after the section ends, there's any you know remaining questions we could ask. Okay. So let's talk about ahram now. So this is a question regarding ahram. So what is an ahram? So in Hajj and Umrah, ahram. When we say ahram, it's actually a state. It's a religious state where in certain halal things become haram. That's what's called ahram. The literal meaning of ahram is to make haram, to make something haram, okay? So this state makes certain permissible acts haram upon you, okay? Um, and nowadays the two cloth that a person wears, a man wears, that's also called an ahram. That's also called an ahram, okay? But when we say to be in the state of ahram, it does not mean just wearing the cloth. So you could wear the two cloths and you're not in the state of ahram. You could wear it right now in your home 
and you're not in the state of ahram. You could be in Mecca and wear it, and you're still not. You have to do something more to be in the state of ahram. So we'll talk about that. So when a person wants to come in the state of ahram, when a person wants to come in the state of ahram, first of all, what are certain recommended things? Remove any unwanted hair from your body. Okay, so clip your nails, um, take a bath if possible, it's preferable, it's mustahab to take a bath before coming in the state of ahram, but wudu will also suffice. Now there's separate rules for men and women. Males, they will don a pair of white towels, they're really long, that you can purchase, um, one for the upper garment, one from the, uh, you know, for the lower garment. And nothing else besides this, so you cannot wear any t-shirt inside, you cannot wear any underwear, you know, on the bottom. No, it just must be the two cloths. Yes, you could have a belt to tie. So you could wear, like, even your normal belt that you wear at home, you could use that belt as well. In normal situations, to wear a head covering is sunnah. But in ahram, you have to keep it open. The rules of ahram are different from normal. Females, and sorry, footwear. And men, they also have to have specific types of sandals, slippers, in which the instep must be exposed. And you'll, um, I'll explain in the next few slides for this. For females, they have it very easy. There is no specific garment or shoes for females. They could wear any clothes that they normally wear at home, wear something comfortable, because you're gonna be moving around. Um, and the only thing is, if a woman wears a niqab, wears a veil, she has to make sure that the niqab or the veil does not touch her face. So normally they wear like a baseball cap with the niqab in front of it, so the niqab doesn't touch the face. The niqab cannot touch the face while they're in the state of ahram. So this is for women that do wear the niqab. Um, so normally, you know, they have solutions for this as well. Um, so for men, they have to wear sandals. Now this is according to the Hanafi school, that the instep, which is over here, that bone, that, bo that bone that protrudes in the front of your feet, that must be exposed. So just normal sandals. Purchase some comfortable ones, because you'll be walking a lot in this. So do not wear the ones that we wear in bathrooms. They're not comfortable for long walks, okay? So you have the, you know, metatarsal bone that sticks out. That's the one that you want to make sure that is exposed, okay? And it's not covered by anything. So this is how the ahram of a man is going to look. It's gonna be above the ankles, um, the whole body covered, bottom garment, top garment, and one of the sides thrown over the shoulders. Okay, so once you don the ahram, so first step is you have to wear the ahram. So you took a bath, you moved unwanted hair, you applied perfume, you could put the perfume on your body and on your clothes, okay? It's impermissible to apply perfume once you're in the state of ahram. But if you have perfume from before, that's fine. That's completely fine, okay? So after donning the ahram, then you perform two rakats of nafil salah for the sake of ahram. And these two rakats, if it's not makru time. So if you're donning the ahram after asar, you won't be able to pray these two rakats, right? So if it's not makru time, then you pray two rakats. Um, and then the brothers, they could cover their head because you're not in the state of ahram yet. So if you don't have a tobi, you could cover it with the end portion of your, you know, um, your ahram to cover the head in salah. Then after the salah, you expose the head, then you make this intention. This is the important part. So you make the intention, Allahumma inni uridul umrata, fayassir hali wa taqabbal minni. So if you're doing tamattur, tamattur, you're only gonna do umrah first. So you're making intention of only umrah. <coughs> so this intention can be done in English, in Urdu, or, or you know, like any other language as well. Though Allah, I intend to perform umrah, Make it easy for me and accept it for me. That's the intention, very simple. Do not complicate it. Certain books might have a very long dua that you don't have to read that long dua. Intention is of the heart. So I wanna make it easy for you. Don't make it difficult than it is, okay? Just a simple intention, I intend to do Umrah, make it easy for me and accept it. If you're doing Qiran, Qiran you're doing Umrah and Hajj together. So you're gonna say, Allahumma inni uridul Umrata wal Hajjah. Oh Allah, I intend to do Umrah and Hajj with this Ahram. Make them easy for me and accept it for me. That's all. That's for Quran. After you say the intention, 
then you have to say the talbiya labbaik allahumma labbaik labbaik la sharika lak labbaik innal hamda wa ni'mata lak wal mulk la sharika lak to say it once but you should try to say it three times once you say the talbiya now you are officially in the state of ihram so again not just by wearing the cloth not just by performing two rakats is after making the intention and the talbiya now a person comes officially in the state of ihram if you're in a group you could do it you know in a group together that everyone says the you know intention together and said talbiya together so this way everyone is in the state of ihram normally we do it together in the bus you know on the way going or if it's on the flight you know then they might announce it that we're about to cross the ihram please make your intention and then you make this intention and say the talbiya Okay, I know certain flights before crossing, they'll make that announcement. They were about to cross the boundary. Those that intend to do, you know, in the state of Ahram, this is the time you have to make the intention. Okay, so. Yeah, so again, the Salat is preferred, recommended, but it's not a requisite. Okay, the Turaqats is not a requisite. That's why if it's Makruh time, you're not even going to pray. Okay, if you're on a flight, you might not get a chance to pray. But if you're on flight and you're staying in wudu, you could pray sitting down. Because it's nafil salat, you could pray sitting down. Okay. So most of us are taking So now we are in the state of ahram. Now we're in the state of haram, so as I said, the word ahram means to make certain things haram. So what permissible acts become haram now? Number one, hunting. Obviously we're not gonna hunt, um, but you are allowed to kill um, snakes, scorpions, insects, etc. that are harmful to you, you could kill them. That's not prohibited. Domestic animals are not hunted. You don't hunt goats and sheep, you just slaughter them. So it's permissible to slaughter a goat, sheep, or camel in the state of ahram. You're not allowed to hunt or help someone hunt. Um, not allowed to have any type of marital relationships that you have with your spouse, you cannot have that, or anything that leads to it, okay? So kissing or anything like that, you cannot do that in the state of ahram. To apply perfume and fragrance, the key word is to apply. If you have it on from before, fine. So if you had deodorant on from before, that's fine. But once you're in the state of ahram, you cannot apply it. So anything that has a scent, anything that has added perfume in it, you cannot apply that. Majority of the soaps that are in the restaurants or in hotels, they have scented soap. So you have to be very careful not to use that. Because subconsciously we always, as soon as we're using the bathroom, we gotta use the soap. So carry unscented soap. There are unscented soap that you can use. So you may use unscented soap, unscented deodorant, unscented shampoo if you want to, etc. It just cannot be scented. So you'll, I mean, if you go to Saudi and you go to the, you know, if you go to Bin Daoud or some stores, they'll have all these products. If not, you could, you know, purchase them here as well from Amazon and other places. Men cannot wear sewn clothing. What we normally wear is sewn clothing with sleeves, etc. Um, but if your shoes are sewn, the slippers are sewn, has stitches, that's fine. If your belt has stitches, that's fine. It's the actual garment, the top garment and the bottom garment, they cannot be sewn. They must be just two pieces of cloth. Sisters, again, no restrictions. Continuing, to apply makeup and henna or any self beautification, that is impermissible in ahram over there. We're trying to show the simplicity and humility and the state of need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lying, abusive language, unlawful. This is, this is impermissible whether in the state of ahram or not. But more so in the state of ahram. So Allah specifically mentions these things. Shaving or trimming any part of the body or breaking anything. So if you have a beard, don't play with the beard so much that the hair breaks because you have to give sadaqah then for the hair breaking. If the hair falls off on its own, you're not responsible. But if you did something to break it, you are responsible. Clipping of the nails, you cannot cut your nails while you're in the state of ahram. You cannot, a man cannot cover their hair um, in the state of ahram. Um, so when you're sleeping, don't wear the blanket on top of your head. But once you fall asleep, you're not responsible. So you run to sleep and in your sleep, you covered yourself with the blanket. That's completely fine. But while you're awake, you don't want to cover your head. Don't use a comb. 
the best is not to use a comb in the state of ihram because it will break hair. Yeah. The niqab or the veil for a sister cannot touch her face. Um, to cause any harm to anyone. Okay. Um, so what are things that are permissible? So these are people think they're not permissible, but they are actually permissible to take a shower. You could take a shower in the state of Ahram. So let's say you're at the hotel and you want to freshen up or you're feeling hot, you just want to cool down. You could take off the Ahram, take a shower, and don the Ahram again. You could even don another Ahram. Because you're in the state of Ahram. The cloth is just one of the, you know, one of the requisites. But it's not that particular Ahram you have to wear. So if your Ahram became sweaty or smelling or it got dirty or food fell on it and there's, you know, there's oil spots, and you don't want to wear the ahram. You could just wear another ahram. It's completely fine. Okay? So you could change ahram in the middle. You could apply bandages. You could wear sunglasses. That's, that's not a cloth. You could have an umbrella. So you cannot cover your head with a cloth, but you could cover your head with an umbrella from the shade. Okay? You could wear watches. Um, you could cover your body with a blanket, just not your face and your head. Um, you could wear a belt, as I mentioned already. And you, you can use a safety pin if need be. Certain people, they're not comfortable wearing ahram and they're always afraid it's going to come loose or it keeps falling down. So they just want to have a safety pin to make sure it stays in place. That's permissible, but if you don't need it, it's better not to. Again, people have preferences. Some people are used to it, some people not. Those that have like wear a lungi at home to wear ahram is very easy for you. Those that have never worn something like this, it's going to be very, very difficult for you. Okay, you'd be very uncomfortable, like one side is up, one side is down, do I look okay? So it takes time, it takes practice. Now we're in the state of Ahram, now we're going to Makkah, whether you're coming directly to Makkah or from Medina. When we enter the city of Makkah, we enter with utmost humility, keeping the greatness of Allah. This is the house of Allah. One thing that everyone notices is in Medina, there is the Jamal, is beauty, calmness, peace. Amazing peace you'll find in Medina. You'll never want to leave. And in Makkah, you see the Jalal of Allah. It's like it's just always hustling and bustling, and there's movement, and it's like it's not peaceful. Because why the Jalal of Allah is there? It's like you're always so keep the grandeur of Allah in mind. When you enter the masjid, it's like it's huge, it's humongous, the Kaabatullah. You feel so small. You know, thousands of people are doing tawaf, and you're just one individual. So you see the greatness of Allah there. So keep the greatness of Allah in mind. First thing is don't rush to do your Umrah. Settle your luggage and all other necessities. If you need to take a rest, if you're tired, take a nap. Because Umrah is, you know, it's hard. It's three hours, it's a lot of work. So you don't want to be completely tired from your flight and like, I'm just gonna go and do my Umrah. And then in half in the Umrah, you don't have strength to walk and you have to sit down. So, you know, go to your rooms, settle your luggage. Um, and then take a rest. If you're hungry, eat something, use the washroom, etc. Do a fresh wudu. And then when you're completely ready, proceed for the Umrah. And in that way, I say also, you have to select a time slot, I believe, for Umrah. So select that time slot which gives you time for you to rest and all that. Okay? Then proceed towards the masjid to perform the Umrah. Again, when proceeding to the masjid, do with humility. Um, keep the gazes low, concentrate on the greatness of Allah. Keep your tongue busy with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and ask from, you know, istighfar, say the talbiyah, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, Allah, labbaik, la sharika lak, labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'amata lak, wa mulk la sharika lak. Recite that as much as possible. And keep in mind, we're not here to sightsee. Things might look really, don't, don't continue to look at the clock tower. Wow, that's so beautiful. How much did it cost? You know, we're not there to sightsee. Just concentrate on your purpose. Um, when entering the masjid, enter with the right foot. Again, the same dua. Bismillah wa salamu ala rasulillah. Allah makfilli dunubi wa ftahli abwaab rahmatik. And make intention for atakaf as long as you're in the masjid. And then when you enter the masjid, keep the gazes down. This is something very unique. That, you know, it comes in certain traditions that the first gaze that a person, when they falls on the Kaaba, Kaaba to Allah, the duas are accepted. The du'as are readily accepted. Du'as are accepted in you know, many occasions, but this is one of the occasions where the du'as are readily accepted. So I always recommend people to keep the gazes low until you're really close to the Kaaba. You're really close to the Kaaba, so you get a good view of the Kaaba, and you can really make du'a for a long time. But if you saw it from far away, and there's like a pillar right in the middle, you saw just a corner of it, your heart doesn't really feel that, you know, the connection. 
So try to keep your gazes as low as possible. If you have a guide with you, if you have someone with you, normally when we had guides, I used to guide people and everyone kept their gazes low until they're like right in the front. And then they would you know, get a nice moment to make the duas. Um, so you know, if you saw the Kaaba before as well, inshallah, every time you come and see the Kaaba for the first time for that journey, this dua will be accepted as well, inshallah. So the moment you see the Kaaba, now you stop saying the Talbiya. Talbiya is said until you see the Kaaba. And once you see the Kaaba, the Talbiya stops, so you don't say Labbaik anymore. Yes? It depends on where your hotel is, it depends on, you know, so it, it's, it's hard to say. It depends on where you are. So there are multiple entry points to come inside. Okay? Yes? As, as long as you're making the door. Yeah, it's nothing to do with blinking or anything. No. So, someone has got one umrah and then they have to know this and they are before Hajj is planned, will this be counted as first time? So, scholars say that the mercy of Allah is so vast that Allah SWT will give this every time you visit. So, just as, you know, just a picture of the Kaaba. Again, it's 360 from everywhere you could enter. Um, people ask, which direction are you supposed to pray? Towards the Kaaba. Okay? Um, so, it's really crowded. It's very, it's very large. There's a lot of walking. So get used to it. Um, usually when people have one specific route, they stick with that route to enter and come out. Um, it, it just makes it easy for you. If you are staying anywhere close to the clock tower area, use that as a landmark to guide you if someone is lost. Let's say you're going as a group of five, six people. And say that if you're lost, Everyone meet at the bottom of the clock tower and we'll meet over there. Because try to look and find the person will be impossible. So it's better to have a landmark that you have like a meeting point later on. Um, so now we'll talk about tawaf. So the first thing to do in Umrah is do the tawaf. So tawaf consists of seven circuits around the Kaaba. Seven times you have to go around the Kaaba and one must be in a state of purity. You have to be in a state of wudu to do the tawaf. That's why women in their days cannot do tawaf, cannot do umrah. They have to wait until they are pure from their days, from the menstruation, and then they could do their umrah. If wudu breaks, you have to go and perform wudu and continue from where you left off, okay? Before they didn't have wudu areas inside the masjid, you had to come outside. Now they have wudu areas inside the masjid underneath the escalators. I'll show you some pictures of it as well. Um, but bathrooms, there are no bathrooms inside. For bathrooms, you have to come outside, okay? Um, so try to use the washroom before you start the Umrah, so this way you don't have to do it while you're doing the Umrah. Um, during the Tawaf, the Kaaba will be on your left side the entire time. I mentioned this why, because some people ask like, which direction are you supposed to go? It's counterclockwise. Just keep in mind, that's always gonna be to your left, okay? So now there's two things for men only. This does not apply to women, but it, is, uh, it applies to men when they perform their Umrah. The first is called Ramal in the Arabic language, and second is called Iftiba. And this is done on every Tawaf that has a Sa'i following it, when you're in the state of Ahram. So what is Ramal? Ramal is the strong, brisk, quick walk with boldness. As we say in Urdu, ki tara chalna, with your chest out. So you're walking like someone who's bold and brave. Um, this is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. And there's a history behind this as well. That when the Sahaba, <coughs> excuse me, when the Sahaba came to do Umrah, the disbelievers of Makkah, they made fun of the Sahaba from Medina. They said that, oh, you went to Medina and the weather of Medina has made you weak because weak, they were a bit sick from their journey. So the weather of Medina has made you weak. You're not strong as you used to be. The Prophet Sallallahu heard this and told the Sahaba that when you do tawaf, show them that you're strong and you're brave and you're not weak. Now this became a sunnah for the ummah to follow now. It's a sunnah for the ummah. So to do a brisk walk in the first three rounds, not a jog. You find people jogging. It's actually just walk with boldness. That's what it is, to walk with boldness. Now if you're traveling with your family, you don't want to leave them behind, right? You want to walk with them. So just make sure that you're walking with a bit of boldness in the first three circuits. If you happen to miss this, there's no penalty, no harm. It's recommended to do this, okay? But there's no penalty if you forgot to do this. Number two is iltiba. 
And istiba is done in all seven rounds. All seven rounds. And that's to make sure the ahram comes from underneath your right armpits and goes over your left shoulder. Just as you see in the picture. So your right shoulder will be exposed during all seven rounds. Okay, during all seven rounds, the right shoulder will be exposed. This is called iltiba. This is only done while doing tawaf. Once the seven rounds finish, then you cover it up. So when you're praying your salah, or you're going safa marwa, you just wear it normally then. Okay, yes? Yeah, we're coming to that. We're coming to that. So the question is that where do we start from tawaf? We'll talk about that. Okay, so here is a just... Um, some picture or some imagery of how it's going to be. So you have the Kaaba, and then you have that s half circle, which is called the Hatim or Hijr Ismail. You have, um, so this is the black stone or called Hajr Aswad, Al Hajr Al Aswad. Then the door of the Kaaba is right next to it. And then Hijr Ismail or the Hatim, that's the semicircle. Maqam Ibrahim is a little structure right in front of the door. And then you have the corners. You have the Yamani corner, which is faces Yemen. And you have the Shami corner, which is facing Sham or the Levant. And you have the Iraqi corner, which is towards the side of Iraq. Okay? Um, and then you have the line where you're supposed to start from. Okay? So this is the start line, and this is the direction that you go counterclockwise. You'll go counter. It's very easy because everyone's going one direction, so you won't get lost. Okay? But you have to start in front of the black stone. Okay, everyone got this? And this is the direction to Safa. So let's take a small little quiz, how's that? So you have the hotels that usually people stay in. Um, there's the door of the Kaaba, Maqam Ibrahim, Hijre Ismail, Black Stone, Yamani Corner, and the Shami Corner. Okay, this is from a different angle. This is a live picture that you can see. Um, the main thing for you to keep in mind is the black stone corner. If all the other formation is too much, do not worry about it. The simplest thing is you need to know where the black stone is because that's where you have to start from. Okay? Okay. Now we'll talk about the actual Umrah itself. So now you saw the Kaaba, you made dua to Allah subhanahu wa to your heart's desire, and now you're starting the actual Umrah. So when you start the actual Umrah, you'll go right in front of the black stone, just, just before that. Proceed right in front of the black stone. Stand in the way that the entire black stone is to your right while facing the Kaaba, and make intention for Tawah. So before you come directly in front, before you come directly in front, have the intention. Though Allah, I intend to do Tawaf, make it easy for me. That's all. There is no specific words you have to say for Tawaf. So many times books are written with very long du'as and you don't have time and you're afraid if I miss a word, is my hajj accepted, is my umrah accepted? Do not make it more difficult. Intention is of the heart. So in your heart, or you could verbally say this, though Allah, I'm starting my tawaf. Accept it and make it easy for me. That's the intention. You're done with the intention. And then move directly in front of the hajr aswad now and then raise your hands just as you were doing salah. So Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and put him down. And then you stretch out your hands as if you were touching it. Please do not go and try to touch it because there's always people there. And number two, they apply perfume to the Hajr Aswad and the Kaaba. You're in the state of Ahram. You cannot touch perfume. So do not try to touch the Hajr Aswad or the Kaaba while you're in the state of Ahram. So from afar, you're just going to make an action of touching it with your hands then kiss your hands. This action is called istilam. Istilam. Once you do that, then you start moving. And you go around the Kaaba. What should you recite? There is no specific dua you have to recite. You could do dhikr of Allah, you could say la ilaha illallah, you could send salutation on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you, you know, know some, you know, poetry that brings you closer to Allah, you could recite those poetries. You could stay silent. You could recite Quran. All of that is permissible. Nothing is specific that you have to do in the state of Ahram. The main thing is to connect to Allah. So you could engage in dua. You can engage in dhikr. If you have a book of dua, if you don't know what to read and you want to read from book of dua, you may. But don't assume that I have to read this on my first circuit, I have to read this on my second, I have to read this on my third. No. Nothing you have to do. The only thing that is 
recommended, not even required, recommended, is the last wall before the circuit ends to read, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adab nar To read that on the last wall, that is recommended. But even that is not required. So if you forget to do that, it's okay. Okay? So then you start, you raise your hand, and you say the istilam, and you start the tawaf. Okay? <clears throat> so proceed to your right and commence the tawaf. Be sure the Kaaba is on your left. Do not turn around. Be sure that you're facing the front the entire time. Try not to look at the Kaaba. You'll have more time later on. Right now, you're engaged in ibadah. So just like in salah, you're not supposed to be looking around. And so, same way, when you're in tawaf, concentrate. Concentrate on your tawaf and your dhikr and your ibadah. Okay? Once one circuit finishes and you come back to the Hajr Aswad, again, you'll just raise your hand, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, kiss your hand. Start the second one. So you do the second Islam. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Once you're finished with the seventh round, once you finish the seventh round, then you also do it, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So you do a total of eight times. You start with it and you also end with it. Okay? Once you do that seven times, your tawaf part of your umrah is finished. Now you'll find people doing all sorts of things. Do not do what others are doing. Just make that your goal. I'm not gonna do what I see. I'm gonna do what I'm taught. So people will be you know, rubbing the Hajri um, Aswad and they'll be rubbing the Maqam Ibrahim and people will say salam to Rukhni Yamani as well and do istilam to Rukhni Yamani. Don't do any of that. Only Hajri Aswad, you do salam. Okay, and you do seven rounds, and the eighth round you do istilam, and you're finished with your tawaf. And that's it. Very simple. Yes, because I said the last wall to read Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adab nar That is mustahab. Now, it does get confusing in which round you're in. So if you have, they have these smaller tasbeeds that are like seven beads only. So you could use that to help you. If you have an app that you just press one and then one, two, three, you could use that. Um, or if you're in a group, the group kind of helps each other out as well. Um, but it does get confusing that, was that the sixth? Was that the seventh? So be sure you, you know, you're, you're conscious of which round you're in. Um, do's and don'ts and tawaf. Yes. Huh? You may talk. So if there's something necessary to talk about, you could talk about Allah, you could talk about the Prophet ﷺ, you could ask what round are we on, you could, you know, you could, you could say all that. Just don't talk about the bears or the bulls or something like that, okay? That's not a place to talk about sports or something like that. So don't talk about worldly things. Talk about like how beautiful this place is, how fortunate we are. You know, yeah, encourage each other as well. Yes? So should we raise one hand or both hands? It's better to raise both hands and kiss. Yeah. Yes. If you, if so, if someone forgets how many rounds, then take an estimated guess and then follow that. Okay, because you won't know. So if you, if you think that you're confused between five or six, but you're more inclined towards six, then it's a sixth. If you're more inclined towards five, then it's a fifth. If you're like completely unsure, then take the lower number. Yes. Correct. No. Start, so if you break your wudu and have to make a fresh wudu, continue from where you left off. From where you left off. Okay, yes. So the wheelchairs, they normally have a separate section at a higher floor, which is a longer circle um, that you have to go. Or people hire people to push the wheelchairs and they're really fast and they complete you know, the tawaf and the sari for you, but they charge as well. Um, so there are services for people in wheelchair, but a lot of people like to push their own relatives as well. So they will not let you be in the main floor, the mataf area. They'll make you go on to the first floor. And there'll be signs there, the wheelchair is this way. So there'll be separate entrances for them as well. So you'll just follow the signs. I'm sorry, can you repeat it louder? I don't know. Yeah, but not, I mean, Hajj time, because of the crowd, they have their own regulations. So non-Hajj days, it's more easier to move around. Hajj days, they have very strict policies.
policies in place. Okay, do's and don'ts in tawaf. So what you should do, what you shouldn't do, tawaf should be completed without interruption. So without a, a need, you should not stop. But yes, if you're exhausted, if you're tired, you need to sit down. Do sit down, take a rest, and then continue, okay? Um, if a salat comes in middle, let's say you're doing tawaf, you know, after Maghrib you started, and now Salat al Isha came. You'll stop, pray your Salah, as soon as Salat's finished, you'll continue again from where you left off, okay? Do not touch anything of the Kaaba because there's always perfume. Dua should be done individually, not collectively. So you find other groups yelling out Dua and the whole group reciting that, you're like, hey, that's cool, let's do that also. No, Dua should be done separately. It's between you and Allah, between you and Allah. Okay, so try to do your own individual du'as. Yes, if you want to do it collectively, but you understand it's not sunnah, you may do it, you know, to assist someone else, but it's better to do your du'as individually. Do not touch the walls of the Kaaba while in tawaf. Do not make istilam to rukn yamani. There is a separate ruling for rukn yamani, but that's if you're there and you can actually touch it and there's no perfume on it. But none of these things applies now. So that's why you don't do istilam or you don't say salam to the rukn yamani. Just only Hajar Aswad, the black stone. Do not push and shove anyone. Be patient. People lose their cool. And I've seen people almost get in fistfights while they're doing tawaf, while in the state of ahram. It's just misunderstandings. They're pushing each other. Someone wants to go really fast and they push the other person's spouse. The husband got upset, you know? Um, so calmly finish it, you know, without any rush. Um, usually the rush is right by the Hajar Aswad where people almost get choked because people are pulling each other's ahram just to touch the black stone. I'm like, this is not the sunnah the Prophet taught us, to harm each other to fulfill a recommended act. To touch the Hajar Aswad is a recommended act. To harm someone is haram. You don't do a haram to fulfill a recommended act. <clears throat> okay. The wudu areas in the masjid. Um, so you'll see the escalators right underneath behind some of them, not all the escalators, some of the escalators have a now a wudu area that you could perform your wudu for sisters and for brothers as well. So this is a really good addition they did a few years ago. They never had this, but in 2017-18, um, you know, we saw this, and even in um, 2021, we saw this as well. So it's still there, and this makes it easy that you, you don't have to go all the way outside to make wudu. The reason is that if you go all the way outside, sometimes they close the door, and then you can't come back in. Okay, now your tawaf is finished. You finished seven rounds. What, you sh what should you do next? You're still in the middle of your umrah. After performing the tawaf, you have to perform two rakats for the tawaf, for the sake of the tawaf. Ideally behind Maqam Ibrahim, if possible, but there's always a crowd, and it's very difficult to pray there. Anywhere in the masjid is permissible. So since we have our family with us, our relatives with us, our group with us, you want to play somewhere where you can all pray together nicely. So go a little bit more further, find a nice open spot, and perform two rakats. Okay, so perform two rakats if it's not makru time. If it's makru time, then wait until the makru time ends, and then perform the two rakats. Thereafter, go where there's zamzam canisters, there's these nice coolers of zamzam water, Go get some zamzam water and drink zamzam water. Drink as much as you can, but don't drink too much that you have to go to the bathroom in a, you know, half an hour. I had people do that. They drink too much, and then in the middle of Safa Marwa, they say, I cannot move any further. I need to go to the bathroom. So drink a lot, but don't drink too much. You need to balance yourself as well. And there's specific du'as for zamzam as well. Okay? Next is called sa'i. Sa'i just means to make effort, literally means to make effort. But in Hajj, sa'i means to go between Safa and Marwa. To go between Mount Safa and Mount Marwa, that action is called sa'i. One key point, it is, it is not necessary to be in a state of wudu. So if your wudu happens to break, you could continue. It is recommended, but it's not required. For tawaf, you have to be in a state of wudu, okay? Before starting the sa'i, Go in the line of Hajr Aswad and do istilam one more time. Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. This is also from the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. So, this is the ninth time that you do it. Okay? And then you go proceed towards Mount Safa. Um, depends on which floor you're in. If you're on the ground floor, you could actually see some part of the actual mountain. If you're on the first floor or second floor, everything, you won't be able to see any mountain or anything. Okay? So, once you reach that area, you face the Kaaba and make intention. Again, simple intention. Oh Allah, I intend to make sa'i. 
If you don't remember to say, oh Allah, I intend to go between Safa Marwa, make it easy for me and accept it from me. That's it. That's your intention. Okay? And then you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and then you go towards Marwa. Okay? So, to go from Marwa, Safa to Marwa, that's round one. And then Marwa back to Safa, that's round two. Okay? So when you come to Marwa, you face the Kaaba, lift up your hands and make as much dua as you want. Nothing specific to do, just dua. And then you go back to Safa. So going from Safa to Marwa is one round, returning from Marwa to Safa is the second round. Total, you do seven rounds. And in the seventh round, you're gonna start from Safa, but your seventh round will end in Marwa. Will end in Marwa, okay? Now for men, it is sunnah for men to walk briskly between the two green lights. Women will walk at the normal pace, okay? So the green lights, I'll show you just now. So this is Safa, then Marwa. Um, it's a quite a bit of a walk. More than Tawaf, people get tired in Safa Marwa more because the ground is very hard and it's a very long walk. So that's why I would say be prepared for walking, okay? Um, so these green lights you'll see on top, to walk underneath it, for men to do a quick walk or a very slow jog. This is not the 50 yard dash. So don't sprint your way across, okay? Just a very, very, you know, um, quick walk or a slow jog. And if you have, you know, sisters with us, the ladies with us, you want them to catch up as well. So once you're done, then walk very slowly so they could catch up with you, okay? Um, so the significance of this Once we're done, right? Yeah, once you're done. Okay. <clears throat> so the significance of this, this is the same area where Hajar alayhi salam, the wife of Ibrahim, she ran between looking from water from here to though um, when Ismail was crying and there was no sign of life anywhere. She went between Safa and Marwa. So the question is that Hajar was a woman, so why aren't women doing this? Why is it only for men? Any answer? There was no men to watch? No, that's not, but she did it herself, right? Anyone else? The question makes sense, right? The, the, the original act was does, done by a woman. So why aren't women doing it in today's time? The same women shouldn't run, they should just walk normal, the men have to do it. Huh? I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Aura? No, no. The aura not showing, I mean, let's say the aura doesn't show. So, in other words, we should just tell the woman to start running, right? The answer to that is we take our Hajj rituals from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our Hajj is taught by the Prophet, not by Ibrahim Islam and his wife. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi taught us Hajj. So we do it how the Prophet taught us. Yes, originally it was by Hajar, but how did the Prophet and the Sahaba do it? He told the men to do it, not the woman. So since this is what the Prophet taught us, we stick with what the Prophet taught us, okay? Because a lot of people get confused, like, Mujibi, like, I want to run also, you know? It's like, no, <laughs> you do what the Prophet taught us. The Prophet told women to walk and told the men to run briskly between the green, between the green lights. So again, it's a very long walk, going back and forth, this is the early view of it. Now, after finishing the seventh round, after finishing the seventh round, you're going to be at Marwa. Now to perform two rakats, not over there, you can walk a little bit inside the masjid now. To perform two rakat is mustahab. So if you still have wudu, you can perform two rakats. This is shukrana, to make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have completed your umrah. Okay? If you don't have you know, wudu, it's completely fine because it's recommended, it's not required. So if you have the ability and you have wudu, after you're done with your umrah, the rituals of umrah, to read two rakats nafil for shukr. Thereafter, the men will go to shave their head or trim their head. If you have long hair, then you could trim it. Minimum you have to cut is one inch or equal to your finger length, your fingertip length up to that much. If you have short hair, you don't have a choice. You have to shave, okay? You will, you'll just have to shave. Um, women will just cut their hair just one inch. Once you cut your hair one inch or shave, then you're officially out of the state of Ahram. Now you're officially out of the state of Ahram. And now until the days of Hajj start, you just do, you know, perform nafal tawafs and dhikr and ibadah as much until the Hajj day starts. 
if you're doing Quran, you will not cut your hair. You'll just remain in the state of Ahram until Hajj starts. Okay? You will not come out of the state of Ahram. So for Umrah, you have to be in the state of Ahram, you have to be in the state of Wudu when doing Tawaf, so seven rounds around Tawaf, and you have to do Safa Marwa. This is a question I always get from sisters. Um, sisters, you know, they have layers, and they have this masala all the time, like, how much hair should I cut? So. Minimum is all the strands of the hair. Minimum one-fourth of all the strands. So let's say there are a thousand strands of hair on the top of their head, right? At least 250 should be cut. Minimum. Okay? Now, how are they going to do that? They need to figure that out. <laughs> okay? Um, so just one-fourth of the head, one-fourth of the hair must be cut. If you could do all of the hair strands, good, not, but it's very difficult to get all. So at least one fourth is the minimum that must be cut. Um, now, when cutting the hair, you could cut your own hair, you could cut someone else's hair, once the rituals are finished. When you're in the state of ahram, you cannot cut your hair, you cannot cut someone else's hair, right? But once the rituals of Umrah are finished, a woman could cut their own hair, a woman could cut someone else's hair as well, okay? Yes. Yeah, so there's barber shops. There's, as soon as you come out underneath the clock tower, there are like 20 different barber shops. They have a set price. Don't try to bargain them. Um, you just go there and, you know, they'll cut your hair and you'll be done. Okay? For sisters, they just go to the hotel room and do it. <clears throat> no, no. That, those two rakats is nafil, but is wajib to pray it. Just tawaf. Two rakats for tawaf. Okay? The, the two rakats that you do after tawaf, make intention of tawaf. <clears throat> now we'll start the hajj days. So all this was for, so now the actual hajj days. <clears throat> so first let's look at how everything is laid out. So you have Majid al-Haram, which is very large, but in the map it's very short. Then you have the Jamarat and Mina. So you see where the Jamarat, Mina, that white area. All that is Mina and tents. Then you have the Mash'ad al-Haram, which is Muzdalifa. And then you have Majid al-Nambira in Arafat. And you have the Mount Mercy in Arafat. And these are the boundaries. So from, from Makkah to Mina, it's about three miles. The entire Mina, it's about two miles. Um, and then from Mina to um, Muzdalifa area is another two miles. And then from Muzdalifa to Arafat is four miles. So it's, it's, it's quite spaced out. And you could imagine there's about a million some people moving from one city, one area to another area all within one day, right? And one day you have to go from Mina to Arafat. And the same day you have to go Arafat to Muzdalifa. And the next day from Muzdalifa you have to go back to. So you can imagine the logistic nightmare that's there as far as the trains and the bus and all that, that's why I say be patient. Be very, very patient. You'll have to wait in these places, okay? Um, so, the first leg of the journey in Hajj is from your hotel in Makkah you're gonna go to, Mina. And you'll spend one day in Mina. Nothing specific to do, we'll talk about that. Then the next day, on the ninth of the Hijjah, from Mina you'll go all the way to Arafat, and you spend half a day in Arafat, Ideally, from the time of Bahar till the time of Maghrib, okay? Then, after Maghrib from Arafat, you'll go to Muzdalifa, spend the night in Muzdalifa. Then, in the morning after Fajr, from Muzdalifa, you'll go back to Mina, and then from there, you'll go to the Jamarat, Palt, and then you'll do your Tawaf, etc. So, this is just an overview of how the days are going to be spread out, okay? So, the first day of Hajj, which is the 8th of Dil Hijjah, the 8th of Dil Hijjah, so if you're not already in the state of Ahram, if you're not doing Quran, you did Tamattu, now you'll come in the state of Ahram. You, you will wear the Ahram from your hotel. You won't go to the boundaries. From your hotel, you make intention of just Hajj. 
It's the same procedure. Take a bath if possible. If not, do what do. Don the ahram, pray two rakats, say the intention, and do the talbiyah. The same exact manner that we did before, now we'll apply for hajj. Afterwards, after in a state of ahram, you want to go to Mina. Try to go to Mina in the eighth morning possible. It is sunnah to perform five salats in Mina on the eighth. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr of the next day. So try to get these five salats within Mina. It's sunnah. Again, we are at the mercy of the logistics of others. So if we can't do it, it's understandable, okay? But have this intention, inshallah. Now in Mina, on this day, the muhrim, the person in the state of ihram, do us whatever you can do. Do dhikr, nafal salah, you pray jamaat within, you know, in your tent, you don't go to the masjid, just in your tent you pray in jamaat. Say labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, dua, tilawat, you'll have lectures hopefully. Um, so try to engage in as much ibadah as possible and take some rest as well. Keep in mind that the Fajr Salah of the 9th Al-Hijjah, this is when the Takbirat Al-Tashriq also start. You know, so you start to take um, the Takbirat Al-Tashriq over here as well. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. So you recite this after every Salah until the 13th Asr. So that's the 8th. Now, this is the city of tents. So Mina, it's just full of tents. One recommendation is once you're there, try not to get out and walk around. It's very easy to get lost because they all look the same. All the tents, all the gates, everything looks the same. And if you don't know your way around, it's very easy to get lost and confused. So try to stay within your tent area. You could just step out maybe and come back in, but don't walk around and you know, explore. I also like to just drop a pin on my map. So if I do get lost, you could always follow your way back. Okay. Um, depends on what packages you have, how the inside's gonna look has changed, but usually they have these type of sofa com you know, bed where you combination beds where in the daytime becomes a chair and nighttime you can spread it out and becomes a bed. You have a blanket and a pillow as well. Food will be served here as well and water to drink. Okay, so now the second day of the Hijjah, yes. No, people just pray in their tents. Yeah, everyone just prays in their, each group make Jamaat you know, in their own tents. The second day of Hajj, which is the main day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, al hajju Arafah. The essence of Hajj is the day of Arafah. So this is the main day, okay? So try to leave after Fajr from Mina, uh, from Mina to Arafat, and try to reach there before Zawal time, hopefully. But again, it depends on your group, you know, like when team. But you want to get there, try to get there before Zawal. So there is a lot to do on this day. So after Fajr is set off, it is sunnah to make a ghusl before Zawal. So in Arafat, it's, the plains of Arafat are used for half a day throughout the year. That's the only time it's used. So the structures are not the best of structures, okay? Um, the bathroom, so they do have a bathroom, but on top of the bathroom they have a pipe that you can use as a shower as well. So everything's in one, okay? So if you wanna take a bath, you could take a bath, just pour water over yourself. Um, so it's soon not to take a bath and ghusl before Zawal. If you are going to Masjid in Namira, there is a Masjid in Namira. If you are gonna go to Masjid Namira, then you have to listen to the khutbah. And then you'll pray Dhuhr and Asr at the time of Dhuhr. Majority of us when we go, we do not go to Masjid Namira, we stay in our tents, okay? So if you're praying in your tent, then you pray Dhuhr at the time of Dhuhr and Asr at the time of Asr. This is the Hanafi ruling. If you're a Shafi or a Maliki, then do ask your scholars you know, regarding these rulings. Now, the main thing to do in Arafah is called wukuf in the Arabic language. What is wukuf? Wukuf is farad, is one of the faraid of Hajj. And wukuf means to be present in Arafat. That's what wukuf means. The literal meaning of wukuf means to stand, okay? But here in Hajj, it means to be present. In the plains of Arafat, from the time Dhuhr starts till Maghrib, to be present. Even if you're there for five minutes, even if you're unconscious. So a lot of times you'll see that there are helicopters from the hospital that are coming with the sick for a few moments and then they take them away so their hajj could be fulfilled, okay? Um, but there's more than that. The minimum is to be present, but what you want to do is you want to make dua. So the entire time, from the time of Dhuhr till Maghrib, 
engage in as much dua as possible. This is where you ask. Make dua for yourself, make dua for your family, make dua for your loved ones, make dua for the ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam of what's going on throughout the world, make dua for sicknesses and pandemic, make as much dua as you can. Try to stand and make dua. If you get tired of standing, sit down and make dua. If you get tired of sitting down, lay down and make dua. But engage in dua and dhikr as much as possible. If you're very tired, take a small nap if you need to. So you're fresh and you could do it. But don't talk, don't chit chat. Don't waste this time. This is a very, very precious time. The Prophet ﷺ plains Arafat, he was out in the sun with his hands in the sky that the whiteness of his armpits were showing. That's how he was making dua. The entire time he was making dua for this ummah. So if you cannot stand for a very long time, stand for a little bit. Just to resemble the Prophet ﷺ and then, and then come back inside. Okay, um, the best time to stand outside is right after Asr time, it gets a bit cooler, it's not as strong, so if you want to stand for certain parts, I recommend you do it right before Maghrib time, 45 minutes before, you see everyone, they're outside their tents, the sky is nice and pink, it's a bit cool, and you can make dua. After the sun sets, you do not pray Maghrib. Normally you pray Salats all on time, this is a time you do not pray Salat on time you will purposely miss and delay your Maghrib Salah. You will not pray it in Arafat, okay? So once the sun sets, you will leave Muzdalifah and you'll go to, sorry, you'll leave Arafat and you'll go to Muzdalifah. And you'll pray Maghrib at the time of Isha. So even if you get to Muzdalifah early and it's still time for Maghrib, you cannot pray still. You have to wait until Isha time starts. And once Isha time starts, you first pray your Maghrib, then right after that, you pray your Isha. Okay? So, after sunset, leave for Muzdalifah without making Maghrib Salah at Arafat and goes to Muzdalifah. Now, Arafat, again, everyone is present there. People like to go to the Mount of Mercy. It's not Sunnah to go there or climb on top or something like that. I actually discourage there because it's very crowded. There's no shade and it's very hot. Your health is very important. This is a time the entire Arafah is Arafah. The entire Arafah is the same, is Arafah, okay? So what's more important is you maintain your health and do ibadah and do dua. Then spend 30 minutes to walk towards the mountain over there. Then there's heat and you're tired and walking back and you really didn't get to make any ibadah, right? So we always encourage people just to stay in the tents or by the tent area, yes. Walking Hajj, people have done Hajj. Like my first Hajj, we did walking Hajj. We did entire Hajj walking. But I was young, and I had a group of youngsters. We were able to do it. Um, and it was not midsummer, <laughs> you know? Right now, it's going to be like 112 degrees, 115 degrees over there. No, not, not necessarily. Even after Fajr, as soon as the sun comes out, it's hot. It's very, very hot. Uh, so we don't recommend um, walking Hajj unless you're up for it. Um, but if you're, if, if you're part of a package, you have you know, proper transportation and everything, you want to be part of the package. If you don't know which tent you're going to if you're walking, there's a lot of mishaps that could happen. But it's, at the end of the day, it's up to the individual. Okay? It's up to the individual. Okay. The tenth of the Hijjah. Okay, so the night of the ninth, you were going to spend in Muzdalifa. So after sunset, you're in Muzdalifa at the time of Isha with one Adhan and one Iqama. You'll pray Maghrib and Isha together. Three rakats for Maghrib, two rakats for Isha because you're in Musafir. So you'll pray two rakats for Isha. Um, it is Sunnah Mu'akkada to spend the night in Muzdalifa. So you'll spend the night over there. There is no sh covering, okay? There's no tents, there's nothing. It's just the open sky. And I like to say that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, when we do hajj, we are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the dunya and the worldly attachment slowly more and more away, away from us. So we start in a nice hotel, five-star hotel in Mecca, you know, comfort, but it's not as home. Allah removes that and we go to a, a tent in Mina. But they're nice tents, really fireproof tents, real good, you got AC and everything. So it's still good, but it's still downgrading. Downgrade the dunya. Then you go to Arafat, the tents are even less quality, <laughs> okay? Uh, and the AC is even, a, so you could say, a lesser quality. So a little bit more sacrifice, less dunya. Then when you come to Muzdalifah, everything is taken away. It's just the open sky. 
Because at the end of the day, you realize that, you know what, it's just you and Allah. And when we leave this world, the two cloth that we're wearing, that's going to be our kafan that we're going to go. Whatever the world we have, we have to leave that one day. So Allah shows us that you're leaving it right now. This is going to be your end result anyway. Don't get attached to this world. So this is a good time for us to kind of ponder how much attachment we have to this world. It's just one night. Um, so you sleep in Muzdalifa, wake up, do some ibadah. Um, it's wajib to make wukuf. Again, what's wukuf? To be present, right? That's the terminology, that's the definition, to be present. So you want to be present in Muzdalifa any time between Subha Sadiq, the time of Fajr starting, till before sunrise. That's the time of wukuf, okay? So you wake up for Fajr, and even if you're there for five minutes after Fajr, you fulfill this obligation. Women and old people, if it's very dangerous for them and they're not able to stay, they could go to Mina in the middle of the night for women and all. But usually we stay as a group and they're able to bear it. You want to collect around 70 pebbles from Muzdalifa. There's pebbles all over. Um, you could just take a, an empty water bottle and just use that um, to put your pebbles in. Um, the pebbles should be the size of a chickpea, not too big. Don't take huge rocks, you know. Um, just take small, small pebbles. You're probably only going to use 49. But you want to take 70 just in case you do one more day. Because once the 12th day is finished, you have an option to go back to your hotel or you could stay in Mina one extra day. If you're staying one extra day, then you got to pull it 21 times more, 21 pebbles more. So that's why you want to collect 70. Okay? And then you want to leave right before sunrise. If you leave after sunrise, it's also fine. Whenever the group is leaving, just go with them. So this is Muzdalifa. And again, Muzdalifa is just open skies and people just sleeping everywhere. Okay? There are bathrooms there as well. The bathrooms are pretty nice. They so use bathrooms over there. And then, you know, there's wudu facilities as well. Um, so this is the size of the pebbles that you want to take. Again, please don't take large pebbles because a lot of times you're throwing a jamarat and you might not have a stronger hand than you thought it was and you hit someone else. So you want to hurt anyone, right, with the pebbles. So it should be small enough that you could throw it as well and if it misses, it doesn't harm someone. Okay, now we come to the tenth of the Hijjah. You, you spend the night in Muzdalifa. Now what do you do? Fajr, you prayed. On this day, we have to pelt the last jamarat. So there are three jamarats. Jamarat is just means large stone wall um, that you're going to pelt. The significance of this is that this is the three places where Shaitan came to stop Ibrahim alayhi salam from slaughtering his son. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim to slaughter his son in a dream, Ibrahim took Ismail, and in three places, Shaitan said, what are you doing? This is your son. After so many years, you were blessed with this. Don't do this, etc., to stop him. And Ibrahim took pebbles and threw it on Shaitan in these three places. So this is the background, the significance of this, okay? But I like to make this very clear. There is no Shaitan there right now. So do not take your anger out. You'll find some people just really taking their anger out on these walls and they take the champal out and they throw the champals also and it's like shaitan ko marunga me, you know? If you really want to harm shaitan, follow the sunnah. And the sunnah is to very delicately throw it. That will harm shaitan more, okay? So there, again, there is no shaitan in it. They just call it bala shaitan, dusra shaitan, tisa shaitan, bada shaitan, chota shaitan, just, just for the sake of talking. But there is no shaitan inside those things, okay? Um, so on the first day, only one of them is open, which is the last one, the farthest one. And you will um, pelt that. It's called Jamratul Aqaba, Jamratul Kubra. In old days, in Farsi, you'll say, Buzurk Shaitan. The word Buzurk in Farsi means big. And like, mashallah, Nek Shaitan, you know, no, not pious Shaitan or something like that. Um, buzurk just means big. Um, so the big wall, or Kubra, the last one. The act of pelting is called Rami. Okay, the act of pelting is called Rami. It is sunnah on the first day to pelt from sunrise till the time of zawal, midday. Okay? But it is permissible to pelt afterwards as well. Usually everyone does it right in the early parts of the morning. The old, weak, and woman can also pelt all the way at night. It means you let the morning pass, let the day pass, and then at nighttime you pelt. We never had to do this. How to pelt? Chickpea size. If you know the dua, you can recite the entire dua. If you don't know the real, just say, Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. Okay, seven times. If you know the entire dua, Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. Raghman li shaitan wa hizbi. Allahumma ja'al hajji mabrura wa sa'i mashkura wa dhammi magfura. You can recite the dua as well. But if you don't know it, it's completely fine. Then, your animal will be slaughtered. 
So you will probably have a group, your agency, they will slaughter the animal for you, and then you also um, trim or shave your head once you're done with that. So in, in the old days, you were able to pelt. After pelting, your slaughter would take place. After slaughtering, then you cut your hair. In today's Hajj, you don't know when your animal is going to be slaughtered. So you're not able to maintain the sequence. So it is preferable, it is better to maintain the sequence. But since we don't know, we just know that it's going to be slaughtered, but we don't know the exact timing of when it's going to be slaughtered. So therefore, it's okay. It will be permissible if you don't follow that order. So you will first pelt. Your slaughter will take place whenever they decide to take a place. You will just go and cut your hair. Okay? You will go and cut your hair. Um, again, shaving or trimming. This will be done usually after the slaughter. After cutting your hair, you're out of the state of ahram. You're out of the state of ahram, so you can now wear your normal clothing now. Yes? So, people know that No, no. That's what I'm saying, that once you cut your hair, you're out of the ahram. So, you're still out of the ahram, and it's still permissible. Okay? So, you don't have to... Um, you can be out of the ahram and your slaughter is still left. Okay? So sometimes you're on the first day, sometimes the second day, sometimes the third day, because you have three days to do it. And they're going to split it up based on groups. So it's okay. Um, once you shave your head or trim your hair or cut one inch for the sisters, um, you're out of the state of ahram. Now you can wear your normal clothing. You could even have um, soap with shampoo and um, soap with fragrance in it. You can use you know, perfume and aitar and all that. All that is permissible. And the only thing you cannot do is have relationships with your spouse yet. You cannot have relationship with the spouse until the tawaf is done. Okay? But right now, you could do everything else. Women will only cut just one fingertip's worth. Now, this is a time I like to encourage the men to bear in mind this advice of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ, at one time, when they're going for Umrah, um, the Prophet made this, uh, he made this dua, Allahumma gfil lil Oh Allah, forgive those that shave their head. Forgive those that shave the head. One of the Sahabi is like, Ya Rasulullah, walil muqassireen. And also for those that trim their head. The Prophet said, Oh Allah, have mercy upon this. Forgive those that shave their head. The Sahabi is like, and the ones that trim their head? The Prophet said, Oh Allah, have mercy on those that shave the head. But the Sahabi really wanted the dua. So he said, what about the ones that trim their head? Then at the end, oh Allah, have mercy or forgive those that trim the hair. So he made three times dua for those that shave the head, but once for those that trim. So a lot of people are like, I don't know if I want to shave. I got to go back to work, corporate world. How am I going to look? Don't worry about that. Your hair will grow back. Inshallah, it'll grow back. You know, um, this is like Hajj is once in a lifetime. So I do encourage that you do shave the head to get this dua of the Prophet Wasallam. But if any of the sisters are like, I want the dua three times also, can I also shave? No, sisters cannot shave. Inshallah, they'll get the du'a just by cutting one inch. Okay, so they cannot shave their head. Okay, now the jamarat, it's, it's a very nice structure of jamarat. So this is how long the wall is. Um, I always recommend is be patient. You find everyone rushing and try to pelt to the nearest area. Go around towards the end of it and it's usually empty. You could stand right in front of it without any difficulty, you could pelt it. So as soon as you go, everyone wants to go. So the front area is always crowded and people are standing 20, 30 feet away and trying to throw there. Just go a little bit around and you'll be able to do it without any difficulty. Okay, so again, this is how they look. There's three, four floors of it. The, the key is not to actually hit the jamarat. The key is that it must land in that spot. So even if you miss it, as long as it went down, it all comes down to that area, it's accepted. It's accepted. But it's really hard to miss. It's a very large wall, okay? Um, but if you happen to miss, as long as it goes down, you're okay. <clears throat> if, if, if anyone remembers, like, in the early 2000s or the late 1990s, Jamarat was just one small little pillar. That's all it was. So what, did Shaitan become bigger? No, it's, just, it's the area that it must land. It's not the actual pillar that's, that's part of it, okay? <laughs> Now, after cutting your hair or trimming your hair, the pilgrims can now proceed to do tawaf e ziyara or tawaf e ifada. No, tawaf e ziyara can be performed until the 12th of the hijjah. So you do not have to do it on the 10th. So it depends on your group, depends on your comfort, your transportation, whenever is easiest. I like to go at nighttime. 
Because the crowd is very um, less at nighttime, you could do the tawaf and sari, everything very easy. So the tawaf and ziyara could be done any time within these three days. 10, 11, and 12. Okay? But it must be done in those three days. After the tawaf and ziyara is done, the pilgrim will do sari, just how you do the normal. Umrah, you do tawaf and do sari. And after sari, you'll go back to Mina. You'll go to Mina. To spend the night in Mina is Sunnah. According to the Hanafi school, to spend the night in Mina is Sunnah. It means if you do not spend the night in Mina, there is no penalty. There is no penalty. I get this question every year. Okay? So a lot of times your hotel might be very close by, you're feeling very sick, and you want to spend the night in your hotel and not in Mina. You may do that. You may do that if you're not feeling well. Okay? And there will be no penalty due upon you. But it's better to go back to Mina. Now the next day, the fourth day of Hajj, which is the 11th day of Hijjah, um, this day you will pelt all three of the Jamarat 777. Okay, so 21 pebbles will be used. 777. The time of pelting for this starts after midday. So you cannot do it in the morning. I recommend people not to go right after Dhuhr. Wait until Asr. Go after Asr when it's a bit cooler. There's actually you know, pathways and everything for you to go, but it's still hot. So why be outside in the heat for no reason, especially when you have family with you, right? So go at a time which is comfortable for everyone. So on this day, you will pelt all the jamarats, and then you'll just come back to your tent, okay? Um, if someone even does it after sunset, it's still valid. And it's sunnah to spend the night in Mina. And on the 12th day, is the exact same as the 11th, you'll pelt all three jamarats. Again, this will be after Zawal. Once you're done pelting on the 12th day, the first jamarat, the second jamarat, the third jamarat, okay, you pelt. After that, you have an option. You could either just end it and go back to your hotel, and you're done with your hajj. Your hajj is completely finished, or you could go back to your tent and stay one more night in Mina, if you want to, okay? So on this day, all three jamarats will be pelted. Pilgrims may return back to Makkah or their hotel before Maghrib. Um, Hajj may now remain in Makkah as long as they desire. They can stay as long as your ticket allows you. Now you just, as a normal individual who visits Makkah, do as much ibadat as you can, etc. The only thing left now is called tawaf wida tawaf wida is the goodbye tawaf, as we call it, the farewell tawaf, okay? Um, this must be performed before you leave the city to come home, okay? This must be performed, it's wajib to do it, it's wajib to perform, but it could be done anytime. Actually, any nafil tawaf, any nafil tawaf that you do after tawaf is ziyara will count towards the tawaf awida, according to the Hanifi school. So let's say your flight is on the 14th. So right after tawaf is ziyara, you're in the masjid already. You finish the tawaf is ziyara, you finish your sa'i, you have time. You could just do your tawaf awida right then and there. And then you're done with that obligation. The Shawafi school and the Mali school is slightly different, so you want to ask your scholars, you could ask me later. Um, but for the Hanifi school, any tawaf that's done after tawaf ziyara will count towards the tawaf wida. And in tawaf ziyara, there is no, ah sorry, in tawaf wida, there is no ahram and there's no sari between Safa and Marwa. It's just in nafil tawaf, that's all it is. Okay? And once that's done, your hajj is completely finished. Okay? Um, so on this, May Allah SWT accept everyone's journey, those of you who are going. May Allah SWT make your um, journey very easy. May Allah SWT remove all difficulties. May Allah SWT accept all the difficulties you have gone through so far, grant you patience, and allow you to finish all the rituals with ease and afiyah. Um, so we'll keep this time now for question and answers. I'll read this announcement that they want me to read. The, um, that sisters can submit their questions at Slido, is it called? S-L-I-D-O dot com and the code oh, okay, let's see. okay this is something else here now okay um, he's controlling it from the inside so if you have any questions sisters S-L-I-D-O dot com the code for it is 8766824 eight, I think they're going to post it up on the screen for you to see as well um, so they'll put the QR code that they could scan on the screen for both brothers and sisters, so they could, they could ask me questions. But those of the brothers that are here, if I haven't covered anything and you have something remaining, please raise your hand so I could ask. Or, Istilam is done, is that you just say, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, 
just imagine you're touching the Hajj Aswad, you kiss your hand, and that's it. No, that's, when you raise your hand, that's only when you start. When you start, you just Bismillah Allah Akbar. And then every other time, you're just kissing, that's all. Yes. So you're Yes. Yes, so if you're going with family, if you're going with your wife, then a few things to keep in mind. In Medina, the salats are separate. The women's area is separate, the men's area is separate, okay? In Makkah, for salah, in the masjid, you're together. They'll just pray a little bit behind you know, where the women are praying, but there's not a separate, delicated area for them, okay? Um, in Mina, they'll have a separate tent. Men will be in one tent, women will be in one tent. The tents are right next to each other, usually. You're, or right in front of each other. So if you have anything to discuss, normally you just text each other and tell them to come outside and you just talk outside of the tent. Yes. Yes, it's together, but normally what happens is the sisters, they stay together. The brothers stay together so in Muzdalifa and in Arafat. What we do is that we have a, a veil, like a parda between the men and the women. It's one big tent, but we just put up a veil so all the sisters are comfortable. You know, they, they don't have to worry about the men seeing, etc. or for the hijab and all that. Men's on one side, but we're all together. We're all together. There's a lecture everyone listens to, the food is distributed, etc. And even in Muzdalifa, the women will sleep just a little bit more separately than the men, but they're together still. So they're not separated ever. <clears throat> okay. Um, wearing a mask in ihram for COVID prevention. So, Yes, we live in a time of, you know, sicknesses and a lot of, um, you know, at the time of COVID right now. So as far as the restrictions of ahram are concerned, that you cannot wear a mask without a penalty being due. So if you have to wear a mask, you have to wear it. If there's legal regulations for you to wear it, you have to wear it. You don't have a choice. When we went Umrah in November, it was required. Everyone had to wear a mask. But the thing is, you're not allowed to cover your face in the state of ahram. So just because you have to do it, doesn't mean nothing is due. You still did something that's against the ahram, right? So you covered your face, which is against the ahram. So there's two ways around this. The first way is very difficult, is that you just make a mask very small that only covers your mouth and your, um, your nose, just that part. But it's very hard to find a mask like that. Usually the mask covers almost one-fourth of your face, right? So since one-fourth of your face is covered, and if you're wearing it for more than 12 hours, you have to sacrifice an animal. You have to give what's called dumb. Dumb means blood, means you have to give an animal, and you have to sacrifice it. If you wear it less than 12 hours, then you have to give sadaqah. You have to give sadaqah. So what I recommend is that don't wear the mask <clears throat> I mean, for the sake of Umrah. I'm not sure what the regulations right now is for the masjid, if you have to wear a mask or not. Um, but if you have to wear it, let's say, at the time of Umrah, then wear the mask right when you come to Makkah. Because the Umrah is only three hours, four hours. So you're wearing it less than 12 hours. But if you're wearing it all the way in Medina, let's say, or you're wearing it you know, at the airport from here, and you already made the intention. Once you wear it, even if you take it off, you know you're going to wear it again. That entire time is counted as you're wearing it. Okay, so if you wore the mask and you took it off for two hours <clears throat> and then you wore it back, because you knew you're gonna wear it back. So as if you're wearing it the entire time. So you don't count only the portions that you wore. You have to count the entire time until you actually stop wearing it, okay? So that is it's gonna be a problem. Most likely people might just wear it the entire time. For every day, you'll have to give one sacrifice an animal. An animal cost about $125 to, to give them. There are people there, there are individuals that you could give them money and they'll slaughter it on your behalf. So you don't have to go and slaughter it yourself, okay? But you have to keep this regulation in mind of the masks. Okay, second is, um, can you please share more details for females area in Riyadh or Jinnah? I have been there and still don't know the pillar I saw in front, what are they called? Um, <clears throat> so this, um, is this gonna be on YouTube? Yeah. So this um, seminar will be on YouTube, okay? So you could always go back and look at it and you'll be able to see the map of, you know, of the Riyadh Jannah that you'll be able to see. The pillar that you wanna concentrate on is Masjid Aisha. 
And that's the one you want to try to pray behind because there's actually reward, more reward for praying over there. All the other pillars, they have a historical significance where the Prophet slept, where the groups from outside of Medina would come and they would stand over there, where the protection <coughs> in the first part of Medina, the first year or two of Medina, the Prophet had two bodyguards that would stand outside, so where they were standing. So those pillars have a historical background to it, but nothing for us to do. The only pillar that you have to keep in mind is the pillar of Aisha. Try to pray behind the pillar of Aisha because it's more rewarding. That's the only pillar you need to concentrate on. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, kind of laws for the 10th of the Hijjah, where are we staying? I understand we are doing Rami and then we are out of Ahram. It's just very confusing here on. Okay, so I'll start very briefly. On the 8th of the Hijjah, it's in Mina. The ninth you go to Arafat, and then and the night you're in Muzdalifa, right? And on the tenth, the tenth you're going to Pelt, and then if you can do Tawaf, and then you come back to your Mina, your tenth in Mina. Eleventh is in Mina. Twelfth is in Mina. Okay, so those three days are in Mina. So you just go to Pelt and come back. How many circuits is Tawaf is Yar and how many circuits is Tawaf Ibida? All Tawaf is seven circuits. All Tawaf. Whether it be Umrah, whether it be Tawaf is Yara, whether it be Tawaf Ibida, whether it be a Nafil Tawaf, every Tawaf will be seven circuits. One time I had a student and he said, Sheikh, I did, you know, I don't know how many he said, um, like 20 Tawafs. I'm like, dude, 20 Tawafs, man, that's crazy. And then I said, that doesn't sound right. I investigated. And he said, he thought that one round is one tawaf. So he did 20 rounds and he thought he did 20 tawaf. I explained, bye. Seven rounds is one tawaf. <laughs> okay, so you did, I don't know how many you did. You did two plus something. Okay, so every tawaf is seven rounds. There is no half a tawaf or quarter tawafs. It's, it's either seven or nothing. Okay. Can we use toothpaste in a state of ahram or no because of the mint flavor fragrance? No, try not to use any fragrance that's added on food for the sake of fragrance. So just buy, um, you know, fragrance-free um, toothpaste if you can. Women have no ahram, but usually requirement aura. While in the tents around other women during hajj, can women take off their head covering? Yes, a woman in front of another woman can remove their hijab, okay? They could relax, they don't have to have their head covered. In front of men, they have to have their hair covered. Um, but in the tent, in the daytime, it gets a bit hot sometimes and they want to relax. That's why the women are separate and usually the, you know, their flaps for their um, tents are closed so men cannot look inside. Um, people, men don't look inside, they stand outside and call their wife's name sometimes or send a message. Um, so they have their privacy as well. So they don't have to have their hair covered when they're in a room full or a tent full of women. <coughs> At what time during Hajj would you be with your family and what time you won't? Um, it's up to you. During Tawaf, usually husband and wife like to do the Tawaf together. It's permissible to hold hands, but if you feel like it's going to lead to like feelings and getting excitement, then don't. Okay? But if you're holding the hands so that you don't separate, because it's possible, right? So you just want to hold your spouse's hands, just you know, keep them together. That's permissible. Um, during the time of Dua, at Arafat, you could stand together and make the dua as well. In Muzdalifa, you could make dua together as well. Um, in Majid Haram, when you're just going and sitting and in looking at the Kaaba, you could be together. So, so you get plenty of opportunities in Makkah to be with your, you know, with your family. If someone behind me is pelting the Jamarat and I accidentally get hit and start bleeding, do I have to give dumb? No. There's no dumb if you bleed in the state of Ahram. Um, if we get to Makkah after midnight on the 6th of July, could you please explain if you still do Hajj at Tamattu? Not sure how it would be in the Arabic calendar. Um, if it's the 6th of July, I don't know exactly because that's based on moon sighting or based on the Umm al Qura calendar. So we will have to go by the Islamic calendar. So if I know exactly which date it is Islamic calendar, I could you know, guide you more. Um, do you have to fulfill Mehr obligations before you leave for Hajj. Interesting question. So Mehr, when a person gets married, a husband has to give Mehr to the wife. If they do not, that is a debt. That's a debt that's due upon the husband owed to the wife. There's two ways you could pay the Mehr, so there's no debt left, or you could ask the wife, is it okay if I don't pay and pay you later? And if she's okay with it, then that's also fine. But um, 
Nevertheless, it's always better to pay your debts, to do your Hajj, but if someone does not pay their debts, that's a separate sin on its own. To delay paying a debt when you have the ability to pay it, you know, dalna, that is a separate sin on its own, but the Hajj will still be fulfilled. If someone does Hajj in that manner, the Hajj will still be ada. it will still be completed. It's better not to do in that state that you, know, that you have sins, you know, hanging upon you. <coughs> Which door do women enter for Riyadhul Jannah? I don't know the exact door number, but it's towards the back, towards the north side, all the way towards the left side. Okay? Um, once you go there, it's very easy to, you know, figure out which door it is. Do you have to wear niqab when someone is in ihram? If a woman normally wears niqab, that's their normal how they go outside in public, then they should wear it in ihram as well. Because that's how they are. You know, you shouldn't just take it off. Because why the purpose is that you're, you know, veiling yourself. You still need to veil. The only restriction is that you cannot have that veil touch your face. That's the restriction. So if a woman normally wears niqab, then they should continue to do that. If they don't wear niqab, then don't start doing it just for the sake over there, you know? Um, if you want to, you may. But, you know, so if a woman normally wears niqab, they should continue to wear it. Since we might not have a scholar going with us as it used to be before this year, can we ask any fiki questions or guidance? Yes, you could have my phone um, number and WhatsApp. Please feel free to contact me um, on WhatsApp for any questions. Please make them related to Hajj um, or something that's um, in, a line, um, in the line of your personal religious questions. Or if you have your local scholars, Darul Salaam, you have Mufti Adimuddin, Mufti Min Hajdeen, you could you know, keep contact with them. You have other scholars in Chicago land. If you're out of state, your local scholar. But do talk to them. Send them a message. Hey, I'm going for Hajj. I might have some questions. Do you mind if I just you know, send you questions? And most scholars that I know will be completely fine with it. And they'll be more than happy to help someone out. Okay? Um, yes, if it's in the middle of the night, they, my phone might be away and they'll answer when they wake up. But they will be more than happy to help you out, inshallah. So don't feel shy or hesitant to contact a scholar for questions. <clears throat> if you leave from, um, I believe that's Los Angeles, on the 4th and you land at 9 p.m. on the 5th of July, what Islamic date is there? Do you make niyat for Umrah on? Again, I do not know the Islamic date of when you're landing. Um, normally they announce it on the 1st of the Hijjah. When the, you know the moon is sighted, they'll announce it. Um, so you'll only find out then. On the tenth, after seven pebbles at Kubra, you do tawaf and return to Mina. Is this tawaf tawaf awida? No. So there are two major farad acts of Hajj. Farad. There are wajibats or many, but two farad acts. That without them, Hajj is not accepted at all. There is no Hajj without them. Number one is the Arafah. You have to be an Arafah. And number two is tawaf is ziyara, the tawaf of hajj. <coughs> These two have to be done. So on the 10th, when you pelt the last seven times, and then you do your tawaf, that's called tawaf is ziyara, that's the hajj tawaf, the main tawaf. You do tawaf and sa'i. Tawaf and sa'i. Huh? Sa'i means safa marwa. You do safa marwa, okay? Tawaf awida is that tawaf you do right at the end before going home. That's called tawaf wida. Keep the word wida similar to the word alwida. The word alwida comes from the Arabic word alwida, which means farewell. So you know when we bid someone alwida, farewell? Tawaf alwida is the same thing, that you're going home, so you're doing one nafil tawaf. Okay? Yes. So is this tawaf where you do like the, the first around the Kaaba and the same? No. So not all tawafs have safa marwa. Tawaf wida, there is no Safa Marwa. Nafil Tawaf that you do in your normal clothes, there's no Safa Marwa. Okay? The only Tawafs that you have a Sa'i is your Umrah and Tawaf is Yara. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, if you haven't cut your hair yet. If you cut, I mean, you could do Tawaf is Yara in, in the state of Ahram as well. So you don't have to cut your hair before doing Tawaf is Yara. You could do Tawaf Ziyara first and cut your hair later. You could do that as well. So Tawaf Ziyara doesn't have to follow a sequence. It just has to be done on the 10th, 11th, or the 12th. 12th before Monday. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can we wear sandals that have a short band over the ankles? For men, no. Your ankles must be exposed as well as the instep. 
This is for the Hanafi school. Um, for the Shafi school, it's only the ankles. Um, can we wear hijab under cap while in ahram? Yes. So a woman could wear a cap. So you know they could wear a hat to you know give them shade. That's fine. Can you wear a hijab? Oh, can you wear a hijab under cap? Yes. You could wear you know underneath the hijab they have a cap that they wear so the hijab doesn't slip. You could wear that as well. If one wants to do umrah on a behalf of a deceased person, when should they do it? Before Hajj or after Hajj? They should be done after Hajj. If someone experiences monthly menstruation before Tawaf Awida, what should they do? If a woman has not done their Tawaf Awida and her cycle starts, there is no Tawaf Awida due upon them. It's maaf. It's forgiven. Okay? So let's say that they did their Hajj and before they could do the Tawaf Awida, um, their menstrual cycle started. The menstrual cycle started, there is no Tawaf Awida for them. They could just go home. Uh, there is a situation for sisters that's a bit challenging, is that they want to do their Hajj Tawaf, it's called Tawaf Ziyara. They want to do Hajj, but their menstrual start, cycle started in the middle of the Hajj. What should they do now? And their flight is coming up. So in normal situations, if a woman is in Hajj and her menstrual cycle starts, she cannot do Tawaf. So she'll wait until the menstrual cycle ends and then do the Hajj Tawaf as soon as it ends. But in today's time, you might have a flight the next day and you cannot stay. What should they do then? If you're, if you're in that situation, please contact a scholar. Okay? There are specific guidelines for that. Many of the sisters, they actually take medicine to prevent their cycle from starting. Um, it does work. Um, so you could take, and those medicines are av available off of counter when you go to the pharmacies in Saudi Arabia. Here in America, you cannot get it without a prescription, but in Saudi and in India and Pakistan, you could get it in pharmacies without a prescription. It's, so it's, you know, it's readily available, and it does help stop the menstrual cycle so they could fulfill their rituals. Um, <clears throat> the accepted Hajj reference earlier in Ayat refers to only Farad Hajj or Nafil as well. Um, inshallah, the ayah and the rewards for Hajj, it's not only for Fadl Hajj, inshallah, for Nafil Hajj, you'll get the same reward as well. Is the day of Arafah going to fall on a Friday this year? That's what people are assuming based on the calendar, that this year Arafat will be on a Friday, which people call it Hajj Akbar, um, which is not really true. It's just nice that Juma and Arafat are on the same day. But if Juma and Arafat are on the same day, there is no Juma in Arafat. You will not pray Juma. There will be no Juma that day. Okay. Um, this is also the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's Hajj also fell. The day of Arafah fell all on a Friday as well. So it will be closer to the Sunnah. Is there fasting involved in Hajj? No. There's no fasting involved, and try not to fast. Nafil fast because you'll take your strength away. There is a um, situation that if you're not a, able to do Hajj, then you have to fast. You know. Um, but that doesn't apply over here. When you perform your first umrah, should you shave your head then, or can you get a proper or full haircut? If our hajj is just a day after, may not have enough hair to shave. Ah, oh, that's a good question. So if someone did umrah and they shave their head, and now the day of hajj came, they really don't have any hair left, what should they do? You just pass a razor over the bald head. Some people are naturally bald, they don't have hair, what should they do? They just pass a razor over the head to come out of ahram. If you're going to do multiple umrahs, let's say hajj finished. Now you want to do multiple umrahs. Okay? Because you're in Makkah now. So you did umrah one day, second day, third day. Your hair is short. You cannot cut it any further, right? You just pass the razor over it to come out of the state of ahram. If you are there until the 19th in Makkah, when do we perform tawaf -i -wida? Again, any tawaf that's done after tawaf -i ziyara will count towards your tawaf -i -wida. So You could do it any time. Which type of hajj is more virtuous? Which hajj did the say that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam perform? So we talked about this. Um, there's a difference in the schools of fiqh regarding which hajj the Prophet did and which one is more virtuous. Okay, in Hanafi school, hajj qiran is the most virtuous because of the difficulty. Because of the difficulty involved in it. Okay? Whether the Prophet did qiran or whether he did tamattu, there's a difference of opinion. Okay? The Hanafis do say that he did tamattu. Um, the Shawafis are on the opinion that he did Quran. Uh, the Malikis are opinion that it was Ifrad. So you got all three views there. <laughs> and because the narrations are so much you know, regarding this. Um, 
I see Arab women just hanging their veil on their face and looking down as, n as not to touch the face, so it's necessary to wear a cap. It's very difficult to just look down the entire time so the veil doesn't touch your face. You're bound to look up, and it's going to touch your face. So it's much easier if you have a cap. Okay, I believe that's the end. Any of, yes? So Hajj Badal is for a person who, Hajj was due upon a person, but they're not able to go because of sickness now. Or let's say a woman doesn't have a mahram anymore. So they could give money to another individual to do Hajj on their behalf, and the Hajj will be fulfilled. That's one. Number two, is that someone, Hajj was due upon someone, they, didn't, they weren't able to go, they passed away. So they, so they wrote in the will that from my wealth, from one third of my wealth, please use it to perform Hajj Badal for me. Then you could do Hajj Badal as well. Number three, someone passed away and never did Hajj, and a relative wants to do the Hajj on their behalf, from their own wealth, from their own wealth, that is also Hajj Badal as well, okay? So Hajj Badal should be done if your own Hajj is already done. Okay. So if I land in Makkah and there is only one day and two nights left in Hajj to start, should I do Tamattu or Quran? Honestly, it is up to you. Um, Quran can be done if it's very little time and you're able to maintain the laws of Ahram, then do Quran. You won't feel the difference. Um, but if you feel like, no, two days is a lot. I mean, you know, days are long, it's very hot, I wanna, you know, wear normal clothing, etc. then do Tamattu. So I don't um, say which one to do, which one you shouldn't do. I always encourage that which is more rewarding, but you have to look at your own situation. If a woman is pregnant during Hajj, can husband do Rami for her if um, getting difficult? If yes, which one of the Rami? If, per, if someone is sick or someone is pregnant and they cannot do Rami, then you could appoint someone to pelt on your behalf. For which one? For all of them. First day, second day, third day, you could for all of them, you could do that, right? So someone is very sick. And we had this, we had people that became so sick, they were bedridden. They couldn't get out of bed. So we will take their pebbles, and then first we will pebble for our own selves, then from their pebbles, we will pebble on their behalf as well. So that is permissible to do. <clears throat> okay, I, yes. Pharmacy is a pretty, yeah. Uh, ZPAC is um, antibiotics, right? So yeah. they won't give it with our prescription. No. So you have to go to the yeah, you have to go to a clinic or something to get. What I recommend, if you have a doctor here that could write it for you, take it from here. That would be the best. Yeah. Um, yeah, people do get sick. A lot of people just lose their voices. There's a lot of dust sometimes. Mustalifa goes in the throat, um, fever. So. The way I see it, that whenever a person gets sick, see it as also as the mercy of Allah, that Allah wants to wipe away more of my sins. I'm such a sinner, and through the sickness, Allah is wiping away more of my sins. And Allah wants me to go home completely pure. So this way we don't complain when we're in sick. We see it also as a means for a cleanse, you know, for us to get cleansed. Okay, one more question. So we first land in Mad Mecca, then to Medina after Hajj, and return back to Mecca again. So can we make tawaf with that after returning from Medina? No. Tawafi Wida, wait. Tawafi Wida is only after the Hajj. It cannot be done before Hajj. So I hope I understood that correctly. So if you're saying going to Mecca first, do Umrah, then go to Medina, then come, um, then going to Medina after Hajj and return. Oh no, sorry, I misunderstood. If we are first landing in Mecca, okay, then going to Medina after Hajj. Okay, so Hajj is finished, going to Medina, and then coming back to Mecca. No, so you'll do a Tawafi Wida before going to Medina because you're leaving the boundaries. When you come back after uh, Medina, then you're just doing a normal Umrah. And in normal Umrah, there is no tawaf -e Wida. Okay, there is no Wida in Umrah. It's only for Hajj. So once your Hajj is finished, and after Hajj, you're going to Medina, you're leaving the boundaries, you'll do your tawaf -e Wida before going to Medina. That's an interesting plan, situation. Everyone has a really unique itinerary for this. MashaAllah. <laughs> yes. So this reminds me, so when we were uh, doing our uh, registration, there was a question, do you want to start your Hajj journey from Mina or from Karaka? So is there like some uh, different uh, school of Hajj to start from other parts of Mina? 
I mean, if you're extremely late and you come to Hajj on the 9th, then you go straight to Arafat, right? But, but you're missing out the sunnah of spending the night in Mina, right? So I don't know why they would have that as a plan. I guess some people, some people want to do the bare minimum and nothing but the minimum. Maybe that's why. Yeah. A lot of times, like, you know, you have the dignitaries and you have, you know, foreign officials and everything that they don't want to stay too long. They just want to finish the bare minimum. They might be doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you can give my number. Um, but I don't know how to post it on this, so you'll have to do that. Uh, no, you can just put it now, wherever it's here. Can I give it to you? And you can just put it on the slide? Okay, so it's just 630. 640. 8821. Yeah. So 630-640-8821. Um, yeah. You can put it on YouTube, it's fine. More questions? Oh. <laughs> so I was also intending to go for Hajj this year, but it didn't work out. So I'm getting my passport back without any visas. <laughs> 630 Yes. Just one request. Please do not add me onto any groups. Do not spam me with any you know, sale of products or anything like that. <laughs> so, majority of you will be traveling. So, the rule for traveling in the Hanafi school is that if you're not staying in one city for more than 15 days, one city for 15 days, then you will continue to pray Qasr Salah, which is all the four rakats will become two. So, your Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha, you pray two rakats. Maghrib will still be three, Fajr will still be two. Okay, um, but Makkah is a separate city, Arafat is separate, Muzdalifah is separate, they're not one. Okay, there's a difference of opinion, but the opinion that the scholars um, that have researched on this, they're saying that they're completely separate, they're not connected. So when we are coming from Medina to Makkah, uh, on the 5th of July, as you explained, so from 5th of July till 20th of July, we are at Makkah, but during that we are at Hajj. Yeah, so exactly, yes. It's all qasar, you all, yeah, the entire time you'll be praying shortened salats. So I have a question about the, the one year, the one that you're making during your Hajj, and the one that we normally do over here as part of the inside of the south. So, what, what is the ruling on that? Very good question. This is a question I get often. Yeah. So, so the qurbani that's done for you in hajj time, that's your hajj qurbani. Now since you will be a traveler, there is no qurbani due on a traveler. A musafir, there is no qurbani wajib on a musafir. So you'll be a musafir. So technically, at hajj as a musafir, there's no qurbani due upon you. Yeah, your family that's staying here, they might have qurbani, right? But your normal qurbani that you do in Eid al-Adha time, that's not due upon a person who's a traveler. If you want to do it, you can, but you don't have to. So your Hajj Qurani is not the same as the Qurani that's done here at home, okay? Um, keep that in mind, they're two different you know, Qurbanis. Yes? Uh, question about fasting and everything No, you should not. It's actually written, scholars say that you should not fast on the day. Hujjaj, those are going, Hajj should not fast on the 9th because you need the energy to do ibadah. So it's actually preferred not to fast. Yes. <laughs> that question you could ask me privately. <laughs> the question's about the meat of overseas and what's, what's the status of it. A um, lot of confusion. I never impose my view upon anyone. Um, or you say that you have to do this, this, that, so you follow the scholars that you follow. If you want to follow, know my opinion, I'll let you my opinion, but I don't like to broadcast my opinion because um, this is not a talk about halal and haram at the moment. Um, but it is confusing. <laughs> Let's just say that. Yes. You mentioned that the Qurbani and the Hajj, the Hajj Qurbani, 
Yes. If you want to, we can. Yeah. The thing, nafil qurbani, you could do as many as you want. Nafil qurbani, you could do 10 nafil qurbanis, right? So nafil qurbani, there's no limit to how many nafil qurbani. The Prophet ﷺ, he sacrificed two nafil qurbanis for the sake of the ummah, right? He sacrificed two for the sake of the ummah, he sacrificed, but they're nafil. So nafil, so one is that wajib qurbani. So the question was like wajib qurbani. So if you're a musafir, there is no wajib qurbani upon you. The only thing for a hujjaj is your hajj qurbani that's that's to do with your tamattu in Qur'an, okay? Um, but over here at home, if you want to do qurbani, your family wants to do one on your behalf, you want to slaughter an entire cow with seven shares, you may do that, but that's up to an individual, you know, like in what they want to do. Yeah, there'll be nothing. Yeah, there won't be wajib. Because there's no wajib on a musafir. Yes. Um... It's, it's, it'll be very hard because he's going to have to go back and forth. But just contact me directly and I'll send you some. Um, so the, yeah, so, yeah, so send me a WhatsApp message and I'll send you some PDFs as well. Very short books to give you the basics as well and some duas as well. Okay? Inshallah. Okay, um, is anyone going for Hajj from Diaz who has done Hajj before in case we need guidance there? So the question is, has anyone done Hajj from Dar es Salaam here? Um, I think everyone's going for the first time, it seems like. Okay. I think that was one of the requirements. Can someone wear a mask if they're allergic to dust? What would be the penalty? So I did mention about masks already. Um, food restrictions. Is there two rakats after sari too? The two rakats after sari is mustahab. It's just for the shuk you know, shukar that you finished your, you know, for umrah. Okay, brothers and sisters. Jazakumullah khaira. Um, if there's any other questions, let's communicate directly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, again, I'll try to help as much as I can before you leave and even while you're there, inshallah. Okay? Jazakumullah khairah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu Thank you. 